a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the Governor's Emergency Order Number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This public meeting is a work session to discuss the budgets with police standards and training, the lottery, and the fish and game, and fish and game. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the house calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with house rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should email LBA underscore fiscal at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. The LBA staff are on the meeting assisting us. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So thank you. And uh, Representative Lynn, if you would call the roll. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, first, uh, Representative Umberger. I'm in my home and my husband is someplace. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Representative Daniel. No, he's he's not available. Oh. All right. uh, Representative Petrie. Uh, it's Representative Petrie here in Farmington. Uh, my wife and the dog again are friggin' roaming around the house. They're not necessarily in the room. All right, uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, present and I'm uh, at my home. Uh, my wife and son are in the house, but not in this room. Uh, Representative Bucco. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm present. I'm home at, in, in Conway and I'm at my house uh, and no one else is here. Representative Heath. Uh, good morning, um, Mary Heath. I'm here in my home in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I am home alone. And Representative Murray. Good morning. I'm home in Newcastle. Um, I'm alone in my office. My husband's in the basement and the dog is somewhere. All right. Thank you. Uh, so all, all, all members are present except for Representative Daniel. Okay, Mickey, if you would bring uh, Mr. Skippy in, I'd appreciate it. I'm also going to bring in Ms. Ames, who's with the Police Standards and Training Council, uh, in case she needs to, to speak as part of the presentation as well. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> is, is good, morning Madam Chair. good morning, uh, chair members. Uh, I, uh, Ms. John Skip, I'm the director of uh, police standards and training. Uh, I am in my home in Exeter. Uh, I do have an adult son who's uh, sleeping in after working the second shift, and he's in the... Great. Okay. Well, welcome to Division Two, and I know this is your, uh, your first time coming to see us. We are actually very nice people, and, uh, but uh, our responsibility is to uh, ask questions and to determine whether the governor's budget is where we want to be and what we want to do. So um, I will turn it over to you. 
I would ask if you prefer us to hold our questions or if you would like us to ask questions as we go along. Uh, Madam Chair, I would uh, defer to you and the uh, committee in terms of ask, asking questions um, during the presentation or at the very end, whichever is gonna work better for the members of the committee. Okay, that's fine. So folks, you heard uh, what was indicated. And so if you have a question as he's going through, please raise your hand and uh, we will call on you. And if everyone except Mr. Scipia could mute, that would be a good thing, including me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, this is uh, clearly an uh, experience for me. And uh, so I have some uh, formal words kind of uh, ready to go. And then uh, I am happy to, uh, to answer any questions or provide any details uh, to the materials that I sent forth. Uh, again, my name is John Skippa. I am the director of New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Council. Uh, the mission of New Hampshire Police Standards and Training is to shape, sustain, and strengthen the competency and professionalism of New Hampshire law enforcement in service to our state. And we accomplish that mission every day by meeting our dual responsibilities of providing high quality, innovative, credible, and responsive basic, advanced, and specialized training, and by adopting and enforcing reasonable, professional standards in a manner consistent with law and considerate to the public trust and committed to basic values and the highest ethical standards. Uh, before you uh, should be a, a seven page document uh, that I prepared. Uh, this is our, our agency budget overview. And uh, there are some uh, I would say some uh, noticeable deltas in some of the line items. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, self-identify those and, and offer uh, explanations, uh, or I am happy to uh, just entertain the questions uh, from any member of the committee, if that's more expedient, wh whichever uh, is gonna work better. I, I apologize. Oh, never... go, yeah, go ahead and go through what all of those are, and um, if we have questions, we'll ask. Excellent, thank you. If, uh, if we refer to the uh, page 1300 of uh, the governor's uh, budget, uh, I'd like to just speak to some of the, uh, the deltas that uh, exist there. Uh, in the, on page 1300 under line 011, uh, which is non-classified salaries, uh, you'll see that there was uh, between actuals and adjusted, uh, there's a, a bit of a difference there. And that is just indicative of the fact that uh, I was hired in March. And so we did not expend all those funds simply because the position was not filled. Uh, in line 020, which is under current expenses, uh, that line is used to kind of uh, cover the cost of consumable items that we use during the course of our business to include paper towels, cleaning supplies, uh, those kinds of things. Because of the pandemic and uh, our inability to run our operation in a normal way, uh, which is a residential academy, um, we did not incur expenses uh, to address 65 people living in our building pretty much all year. Uh, we conducted a vast majority of our training during this pandemic uh, whenever possible over Zoom and uh, only brought the recruit officers back into the building uh, when we really needed to uh, for those hands-on and skills development classes that we teach. And that's why you see that that delta there between actual expenses and adjusted. Uh, in line 024, 024 uh, speaks to the maintenance other than building and grounds. And you'll notice that this is a, there's a huge uh, change, a huge delta uh, between our 
21, 22, and the budget going forward, 22, 23. Uh, specifically, uh, the increase is uh, caused by uh, two uh, new items, and I'll, I'll, I'll call them new. The, the first one is uh, that we were in desperate need of a record management system slash training management system. Uh, presently, uh, our, uh, the way that we uh, manage files and information is, is very antiquated. Uh, we still candidly use a fax machine uh, to have people fill out uh, applications to, to attend training here at the academy. Uh, this was uh, an issue that was identified in a uh, 2018, I believe it was 2018, maybe 2019, uh, check that, it was a 2019 audit that had been conducted by the Legislative Budget Assistance uh, Division. And, uh, and then certainly uh, during the LEAC Commission, uh, the uh, commission recognized uh, the, the vital importance of being able to maintain very accurate records uh, to uh, allow us the opportunity to track uh, each officer's training uh, and to uh, be uh, very organized with regard to the, uh, if there's any disciplinary uh, issues. So this record management system was something that was identified from two different sources, uh, unrelated sources, the, the uh, LBA audit and uh, the LEAC commission. Uh, PSTC had actually set aside funding, uh, be, but in response to the pandemic, initially uh, the governor asked all state agencies to um, hold off on any purchases. And so we held off using those capital funds for the initial purchase until such time as uh, the state could reassess, the governor could reassess where we were financially and um, ultimately allowed for us to expend those capital funds. The increase that you see there will be the, the annual cost going forward to maintain that learning management system, record management system. Uh, we are working with uh, the vendor uh, that we ultimately went with, and they are in the process of uh, customizing that system so that it works for us exactly the way we want it. Uh, there's uh, a second piece to that increase. Uh, we have a device, a training device that we use here at the Academy. We refer to it as the Vertra. Uh, the Vertra is a uh, 360 uh, decision-making simulator, and uh, we can train a number of police officers uh, at a time uh, without expending uh, live ammunition or simunitions ammunition. And uh, we can do it in a very, very safe way. Again, uh, this is a, a device that relies heavily on uh, software and computers and things of that nature. And uh, for that reason, uh, we have annual subscriptions that we have to um, put forth to maintain uh, the virtual device. And so uh, two big increases there, and, and those are the reasons um, for those increases. The, um, so we've moved through here. I would ask you to go to uh, page 1301. And again, uh, I, I will point you to, um, line zero one zero and uh, that speaks to uh, personnel. You'll see that there's a, a, a jump in the, the full-time uh, line. After, uh, during the LEAC commission, uh, the, uh, the commission recognized a number of uh, things that they wanted addressed in the area of training of our police officers here in New Hampshire. And uh, as a commission member, uh, I supported uh, all of those recommendations. Uh, the, the, the truth is that um, 
uh, the training mandates have now imposed uh, a greater workload where our existing resources just can't handle uh, the, the extra workload that came from those mandates. And so uh, I requested uh, support from the governor to allow uh, for the addition of one extra training specialist full-time and uh, also a full-time instructional design person. Uh, clearly the training specialist will assist in uh, looking at uh, our curriculum, helping us uh, deliver more scenario-based training, which was an important piece from the LEAC Commission. Uh, one thing that the Academy really has never had before in all the time that it's been in existence, and this is our 50th anniversary this year, uh, so we're very excited about that, but we have never had an instructional design person on our staff. Uh, candidly, all of our training specialists who are excellent trainers in every regard, uh, their, their primary uh, focus is law enforcement. And I believe uh, we had up until a retirement last year, we had two people who have formal educations in curriculum development and adult education. It's important that we have an instructional design person for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, the trainers while they write curriculum, they also have to deliver the training. And so a vast majority of the time, they are engaged directly with that. Uh, the other very important piece is that uh, we are moving towards developing and deploying a high quality online training using our, our online training system. It's important that as the primary source of in-service training for New Hampshire police officers, we are able to do this so that we can deliver in-service training in a very fiscally responsible way where we can push training out online. And uh, that assists every city and town to allow their officers to receive that training without uh, having to travel uh, to the academy and uh, it, it alleviates the problem of backfilling or paying overtime uh, from the source agency. And uh, this is uh, clearly uh, the single best way for us to make sure that training is consistent across the board. It is accessible across the state. And you know we, we have a responsibility and I have a responsibility to make sure that uh, a three person police department has the same equal access to this training as, as a large city police agency does. Uh, and, and so um, it, there's gonna be a little bit of a heavy lift in the front to develop the content and keep the content going. I have excellent, uh, uh, excellent bureau commander that's uh, leading this charge right now. We, I have some excellent people that are assisting, uh, but we really do need that instructional design person to work in the background uh, to help build out and kind of the technical side of putting that training content into the computer and being able to manage it in an online way. The, um, the next real big delta that you'll see is I'll direct your attention to line 021. Uh, 021. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to do it now or do you want to wait until later? Oh, no, uh, I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Can you just say a little more about the training specialist and the de instructional design specialist? I guess two things. One, where do they get trained? And you know, are they boots on the ground? Are they academics? Is it a combination of both? And secondly, are you looking for any, because some of this is sensitivity training, um, are you looking, what particular considerations are you giving to the kind of person you would hire? Uh, thank you, that uh, excellent question. And just to answer the, the first piece, uh, the, the uh, training specialists are uh, proven law enforcement officers uh, who have uh, a high level of experience working as police officers and supervisors of police officers before they come to the academy. Uh, our target audience for the recruit training uh, is 
are those people who are coming into the business. So they have no real foundation. Uh, so a vast majority of the training specialists uh, come to us from their agencies as field training officers, uh, corporals, sergeants, uh, lieutenants. They, and, and those are really the people I need. I need people who can model, mentor, uh, and speak with uh, legitimacy because uh, they come from the very place that we're preparing these officers to go to, which is in a police car uh, responding to calls for service. Understand that, uh, and, and I appreciate the fact that you recognize that we really have to have a foot in, in two different places. We have to have a foot in the world of law enforcement and they have to be excellent police officers to teach here. On top of that, they have to have a very, very strong understanding of adult learning theory, uh, curriculum design, and instructional delivery. And, and candidly, in some of those cases, uh, I have to take really, really good cops and then make sure that they have uh, a clear and firm understanding on curriculum development and instructional design. So they receive ongoing training both in their their topic areas. So for instance, I have a firearms instructor, the lead firearms instructor is preparing to uh, go to a, a firearms instructor uh, program uh, in Connecticut once, once COVID kind of settles down. Uh, I have, uh, I have uh, an in-service class that we're getting ready to deliver on instructional design and then uh, the train the trainer instructional design. And actually, I'm, I'm uh, bringing uh, a group up from Massachusetts that I worked with when I was a director of a police academy down there. And it is very, very important that we, we have sound uh, instructors that are working from uh, the, not only the police world, but also from the education world. With regard to that instructional design person, I don't need somebody to be a law enforcement person to, uh, to fill that role of instructional design. Uh, instructional design person, I really need them to be very strong in curriculum, online um, content delivery, uh, the forming of online training. Uh, and I, you know, could I use more than one of them? Yes, I could. And, and I, you know, I understand uh, that I have a fiduciary responsibility and at the same time, you know, meet the needs and challenges that are before us uh, in our mission. Uh, but I, I foresee that this instructional design person would work directly with each of the training specialists to kind of be the rudder in the water and help each one of those uh, trainers uh, develop high content, make sure that learning objectives are clearly established, that test questions relate directly to the learning objectives. And that uh, if we do uh, case studies or scenario training, that is tied back into learning objectives so that we can measure, we can clearly and objectively measure competency from when the, the recruit officer first enters the police academy uh, during their progress, during the session, and then uh, measure their competency as they get ready to graduate. And, and I hope that answers your question, ma'am. Representative Heath, you have a question? Yes, I do, Madam Chair, thank you. And thank you for taking my question. Um, I just am so pleased actually to hear um, the additions that you're making, because I think sensitivity is so critically important. COVID has changed the way we're all working. Um, my question is kind of related to your whole budget. Um, and um, it relates to the, the funds, the federal funds that are coming into the state of New Hampshire. Within your budget, um, you know, you, you've talked about the changes that you need to make um, it, that you've already incurred in order to be able to reach those uh, to whom you're responsible. Um, are any of these costs things that can be charged back to costs directly associated with COVID so that maybe there'd be some federal reimbursement for some of these things that you're um, including in your budget. Thank you for taking my question. Yes, ma'am. 
uh, in fact, um, uh, my first day as the director of the police academy was March 16th, and my first official act was to shut the academy down. Uh, and and it's been uh, it's been quite a ride uh, since the beginning. Uh, to that end, uh, we were given very clear instructions uh, from the governor's office as department heads uh, to uh, track any costs incurred that were directly related to uh, sustaining our mission. Uh, but uh, where those expenses came in because uh, of uh, directly from COVID impact. And so uh, we have been very, uh, very cognizant and, and uh, have, have kept track of those costs to include, you know, we had to buy some, um, some flat screen TVs. We had to kind of uh, up our game with regard to uh, Zoom subscriptions. Uh, I'll, I'll, there was uh, some work done for cleaning issues inside the building. So we have done everything we, uh, we can in terms of tracking uh, those costs that are directly related to COVID response. And, um, and we continue to do that. I, I don't know, uh, this is uh, clearly above my pay grade in terms of, of being able to speak to maybe other opportunities. And I, I do not know the answer to that question, uh, but you know, I certainly uh, know people who I could ask that could maybe fill in that blank if that's helpful. I, I um, it, Representative uh, Murray, I, I did fail to answer the last piece of your question. Uh, you spoke directly to sensitivity training and, and um, implicit bias. And, and I do, I apologize for letting that one slip. Uh, I want everybody to know here that uh, even before uh, the LEAC Commission began to meet, uh, I worked uh, very closely with um, Eddie Edwards uh, and a, a number of uh, experts, subject matter experts in the area of uh, cultural diversity. And uh, we used um, resources from the ACLU, we had the NAACP, uh, I had academics from the University of New Hampshire and from Keene State College. And uh, that working group uh, put together a tremendous uh, implicit bias procedural justice class uh, that I'm very proud of. I had a uh, particular training specialist who oversaw the project uh, and, and they really did an excellent job. And, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, the response from the recruits, uh, we just delivered the first block of instruction this last class and the recruits uh, loved it in every way. Uh, and the best part was the panel discussion. Uh, and the biggest complaint was that there wasn't enough time for the panel discussion. They want that to be longer. So uh, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of revisit that curriculum, uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things I think that is very important to recognize is that there's a tremendous amount of talent in the state of New Hampshire uh, and using the University of New Hampshire, using Southern New Hampshire University, Granite State College, the technical college across the street. Uh, we have excellent subject matter experts to help us in, in developing high, high value uh, content uh, that is meaningful and is uh, and speaks to uh, the conditions and environment here in our state. And uh, I, I have um, been very excited to work with uh, all of those groups and I will continue to work collaboratively with those learning institutions and, and other, other groups to help us make sure that we're doing the very best job that we can. So I, I apologize for that, Representative Murray, but I wanted to address that. Representative Murray, did you have a follow-up um, yeah, just two quick things. I was gonna. I would thank you for circling back. I would have if you hadn't. <laughs> um, is it possible to sit in on some of those sessions? Is there an audit available? Are these Zoom classes, or is that totally inappropriate? So, so it, it, it uh, it's an excellent question, and one that has been asked of me many, many times since uh, we've started to introduce some of these classes. And uh, it, you know, I'm happy to share with you. Um, the, uh, the lesson plan, if that's helpful to you. You know, one of the things that I am most 
uh, fearful of, it, candidly, is that uh, you know the people who sit on this panel uh, allow for for tough conversations to be had, right? And uh, we we really are encouraging uh, people to ask questions uh, and 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 get answers, you know, and, and uh, you know some tough answers too, right? And my fear is if we allow people who are not part of that class, and I, I look at this, I guess, from an educational point of view, I, I don't want to have a chilling effect where now all of a sudden I have these young police recruits that were going to ask a question, but oh my goodness, there's a representative from the House of Representatives in this room, so I, I'm not going to ask that question. I've had a lot of reporters ask the same thing. Can we sit in on this class? And you, you, uh, you can only imagine how quiet everybody's going to get when there's a reporter sitting there taking notes. So, um, I, I, and in this isn't a hard no. I, I'm still trying to figure out how we do it. Um, I don't know uh, if we allow uh, maybe some Zoom access uh, so that people aren't in the room, and maybe you um, maybe you come to my office, you know, at the academy, and we can sit in my office and we can zoom in on the class from there, kind of thing. I, I, I'm I want to be open and transparent, and at the same time, my primary function and responsibility is to make sure that what we're trying to get across during this block of instruction and every block of instruction is going to have the highest value and the greatest meaning to the recruits. So, um, but I, I, and I'm happy to work with you offline uh, if that would be helpful. Cause I, I do want to figure out a way to do that. So. Understood. Thank you so much. Representative Bucco, you have a question. Uh, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Skipper for coming today. Um, it, in this, where you have the um, uh, training specialists and instructional design specialists, is that just two positions? Those are two full-time positions that I requested uh, the governor to to consider, and and he has supported those two full-time positions. Okay. I, I, again, and, and maybe I'll jump to. Um, uh, I, I just wasn't sure if I heard two or three, but it's two. Okay. It is two. It is okay. two. Thank you. Unless you wanted to make it three. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank the, you, sir. You're welcome, sir. The um, I think I was getting ready to talk about food. Zero, two, one. Um, you'll see that there is a pretty significant delta on actual expenses versus the adjust. Uh, 2021 adjusted authorized. And then uh, you'll see that the, again, the number goes up a little bit for 22-23. And again, <clears throat> traditionally, uh, the way we deliver the academy, it is a 16-week paramilitary residential environment. And uh, I am a product of that environment. Uh, I graduated from the 88th session. Uh, and then I had the, the privilege to work as a training specialist on the other end of the building for a period of time during my career and, um, and then managed that same kind of delivery system. So, uh, you know, now we're looking at pretty significant costs to maintain the delivery system that we have now. And, and there's a lot of value to, to uh, continuing the way we do it. And but there's also, you know, we have to ask ourselves some hard questions, and that is, can we do it a better way, and can we do it in a more fiscally responsible way, and can we leverage uh, maybe funds directed in one direction, maybe we can leverage those funds to further augment training. So uh, I, I, I kind of speak in generalities here, but understand that that delta for food institutions speaks to the fact that we we did not have a residential session. We have not had a residential session since I've been here because of COVID. And, uh, and that's why you see those savings. Uh, you'll see that the number went up in 22-23. Uh, again, we had to sign um, a contract with the, with the sole food provider uh, so that we could be prepared uh, in the event that we can kind of go back to our old uh, operation, 
and we're prepared to do that. Uh, so uh, I anticipate uh, based on COVID that we're probably gonna see some savings during 22, 23, um, you know, from this particular line. If I might, Mr. Scipio, do you, do you have a quote unquote target date for um, getting back to the uh, classroom style of uh, learning? Yes, uh, yes we do. Um, one of the, uh, my, I rely heavily on uh, the view and opinions of the people that work for me and the training staff came to me before the session began in January and expressed a lot of concern relative to the surge that was being anticipated uh, and in conjunction with the rollout of vaccines. And after discussion, I made the decision to go to a completely remote uh, delivery system until such time as we were forced uh, because of the fact that we run out of, of lecture style classes. Uh, we're gonna push all the skills development classes to the back of the session. And uh, we were hedging our bet to, to get vaccinations out uh, so that we could return as quickly as possible. So we're anticipating, uh, and the, the, uh, the date that, that we've kind of set on is April 1 to begin face-to-face in-service training again, still continuing with all the safety measures, screening, masks, social distancing, uh, but it is my opinion, uh, certainly my staff, I'm a little under the weather right now. I got my second shot last night, so I'm, I'm kind of plugging through here. Um, my staff has been vaccinate, va vaccinated uh, and a vast majority of the police officers that we're going to have in the building will have been vaccinated. And that the hope is to get back operationally uh, to the way we used to be. So we're looking at April 1st, but clearly, um, we need to maintain flexibility, follow the directions from the governor's office and the Department of, of uh, Health, uh, just to, to make sure that we're, uh, we're gonna keep people safe and still, still complete our mission. So uh, we're, we're staying flexible. Uh, if I could, um, I know that your, the majority of your training is for brand new police officers. Uh, do they automatically get the shot um, I mean, I, I know that, uh, you know, first responders and police and so on have, have that opportunity, but the new recruits, are they automatically getting a shot or is that something we can require them to have before they attend the academy? Uh, it, it's, uh, that's the same thought process, process that, that I was using as well in terms of GSU mandating that they get this shot before they come back into the building. And uh, I had the occasion to speak with the AG's office on that. And, you know, ultimately, um, because you must be hired by an agency before you can attend the police academy, uh, they automatically are uh, considered uh, police employees. And uh, my understanding is that a vast majority of those recruit officers uh, are receiving um, or, or they have the opportunity to receive that vaccine. And from a, a continuity of operations standpoint, and, and it, it may sound a bit uh, selfish, but uh, we, I could not afford to have any of my training people get sick because there's, there's so few of us and, and we are the sole source for recruit training. Uh, I am confident now that once my staff has received the vaccines uh, and we still maintain those safety measures, uh, we'll be able to continue operations um, even if uh, people that are coming into the building may or may not have received that vaccine. So uh, while, while it sounds, I, I hate to sound that, you know, as far as working, we're safe, so everybody's safe, but from, from a pragmatic point of view of continuity of operation, uh, I think that we'll be good to go as the surge comes through, the vaccines go up, and we still maintain those, those safety measures. Thank you very much. Representative Heath, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for taking my question. 
um, to continue on with your um, discussion about the training, um, in the LIAC commission, um, a lot that came out in that report that our existing police force um, needs to be updated. Could you just describe the steps you're going to take to employ some elements of the training and particularly in the sensitivity um, and cultural awareness areas, please? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, uh, the governor's executive order 2020-19, uh, the LEAC commission report and the 2019 LBA audit are, are literally the roadmap that I will be following and, and our organization will be following in the next couple of years. Uh, and, and that's a good thing, I think, because uh, there's a clear direction that our organization needs to move, right? Uh, some of the mandated uh, training that has been identified and uh, set forth in that executive order speaks directly to ethics, de-escalation, and uh, implicit bias and cultural diversity. In fact, uh, the recommendations from LEAC and the governor's order uh, mandate that every police officer in the state of New Hampshire to maintain their certification must annually complete those three two hour blocks of instruction. We have about 4,000 police officers in the state of New Hampshire and uh, my training staff uh, presently uh, is, I believe it is eight people uh, deliver training. Uh, we have to rely heavily on volunteers from agencies throughout the state to help augment our training efforts. Uh, to that end, I, clearly I understood that uh, in order to reach 4,000 people annually, uh, we have, we have got to really build out our online in-service learning program uh, because the, candidly, there would be no way for us to complete that mission uh, with, the, with the staff that I have. There's just no way, you know, we literally would be teaching that, that program every day throughout the year just to, to keep up with those in-service people. And that's just one, one small piece of training that we're ultimately responsible for. Further, uh, it's important to recognize that the LEAC Commission and the governor's executive order uh, mandates that the required number of hours of in-service training needed to be increased. So presently we have eight hours of mandatory in-service training plus uh, agencies are also required to deliver four hours annually of firearms and use of force training. Uh, and then they have to qualify with their firearm. We are moving from eight hours annually all the way up to 24 hours annually. And so we've increased uh, by way of LEAC, by way of the uh, executive order. Uh, and candidly, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's important and the right thing to do to increase that mandatory in-service training. Uh, continuous training is going to make our excellent police officers even better. Uh, but now, you know, the, the load is significantly increased with regard to the delivery of that training, the development of that training. And so, um, you know, my hope is, uh, and again, uh, I'll, I'll get to that second line, but ultimately I had requested uh, from the governor uh, his, his support for those two full-time positions that I've already spoken to. And, and again, I, I was trying to be financially responsible. So I, I asked for two part-time training specialists as well, uh, understanding that it would be less expensive to hire uh, some part-time people to help augment uh, these efforts to to uh, to take care of this, these these new initiatives that have been um, uh, given to us, you know, as an organization. Uh, it's it, it, candidly, I, I you know, my hope is that uh, these increases that we're talking about here today are going to uh, set the organization up to be highly successful in the mission. Uh, 
you know, I don't know. I don't, I, we have to see how it goes now. You know, we've been working in a COVID environment. Uh, we, we're trying to build the airplane while we're flying it in some cases. Uh, there has been, we had to develop a new ethics program, a new, uh, you know, de-escalation program, a new cultural diversity implicit bias program. Uh, we have to increase scenario training dramatically from where we're at now, which it was another LEAC recommendation and mandate from, from the governor's office. These are all very important things that have to happen. Uh, but it, the, the, it, it is going to be, um, th there's going to be a lot of heavy lift that's going to come with that. Uh, something else that uh, we're looking at right now is uh, the last job task analysis to measure core uh, components of a one to five year police officer. That job task analysis has not been conducted in New Hampshire uh, for 20 years. And we should be doing a JTA about every five years just to make sure that the curriculum that we're delivering right now speaks to the, the core competencies that a one to five year police officer uh, needs to be able to, to demonstrate when they're out there working in their communities. Um, so once that job task analysis is completed, I, and I'm very excited, I'm, I'm working with the University of New Hampshire's uh, Justice Studies uh, Department. Uh, that is a capstone project that a graduate student is working on right now, uh, along with the professors at UNH. Uh, it is a very meaningful project to a, a UNH student. It's saving the state's uh, significant amount of money, uh, but we are on UNH's schedule now. So I, I can't make it go any faster than, than the semester. And I want, I want the student to be successful too. But after that JTA comes out, we now have to do a complete curriculum review. Every single block of instruction that we deliver that makes up this curriculum has now, we, I now have to collect subject matter experts from the state. This is what we do now. Here's the job task analysis. What changes, if any, do we have to make to be in line with that JTA? That's gonna be a huge, huge lift. That's gonna be a lot of work. And I can't call a timeout. Uh, if I did not deliver a, a, an academy, one academy, that would significantly impact the state of New Hampshire uh, and every law enforcement agency that's trying to fill open positions so that they can police their communities. Um, so we have to, I still have to keep the plates spinning over here. And, and then we have some really exciting challenges in front of us and they really are exciting challenges, but there's gonna be a lot of work attached to it. So my hope is that the new training specialist, the instructional design person, and then the two part-time training specialists um, will be able to uh, really absorb uh, a lot of what we have going on uh, in the, in the near, near future, in the near future. Uh, so that we can we can address the the components of the mission that's before us now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Representative Lynn, you have a question. Uh, you're on mute. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Skip, I, I I guess. Um, from what you've said already, my understanding is that most of the recruits that you get as new officers are relatively young. I would presumably in their 20s or maybe early 30s. Yes, sir. And, and I wonder if you could just uh, tell me, do you, could you generally tell me what would be the age or roughly the, you know, the average age of your instructors? So uh, I, with, with uh, some, uh, Aberrancies here and there, we're probably averaging uh, recruit age is probably uh, right around uh, 23 to 25 years of age. Uh, we get a lot of these uh, recruits who are uh, military veterans and or college graduates. And so that it puts them right around, you know, that mark. Uh, we have some people who are, are hired literally. Uh, you only have to be 18 to be a police officer here in New Hampshire. 
and occasionally we'll get an 18 or a 19 year old in there. Not, not often, but we do. And then uh, uh, in this present session, we have people who, um, you know, had a career and have done something uh, for 20 years and then they're jumping into police work. Uh, candidly, uh, they're excellent people to have in the, in the, the room because they, they provide perspective, uh, real world perspective with their classmates. The training specialist, average age of a training specialist that I have here, and, and uh, instead of putting an age on it, I'm gonna put a uh, time in service on it. I, I generally have people that have 10 to 15 years of law enforcement experience uh, on staff and, and, and in those positions as training specialists. So you're probably looking at people between the ages of 35 to 50. So probably, uh, you know, probably 40, 42 years old if you're looking for one number on an average. Um, now, it, I can tell you that, that these people that work as training specialists uh, are, are running a mile and a half in about 10 minutes and can do a hundred push-ups, and I mean, they're uh, they're in phenomenal shape and and they're able to uh, clearly uh, act as excellent mentors and instructors in those areas that they teach. Um, uh, but they they are about 10 to 15 years older than the recruits that they're teaching. Okay, so so may I ask a follow up? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, so I guess what really what, what I, I mean, what I was, where I was kind of going with these questions is if the recruits are very young and the instructors are 25 to 50, let's say, and are in, you know, as you just said, generally in excellent shape, I guess I'm, I'm not, it, it's not clear to me why you haven't resumed in-person uh, instruction um, now in the same way that we're sort of, you know, we're, we're, we, we're trying to kick the, the schools uh, in the fanny and excuse my, excuse my language, but we're trying to kick the schools in the fannies to get back to in-person learning um, where there seems to be a lot of reason to say that they could. I'm, I'm just wondering why you're not doing that, you know, sooner than you seem to be, at, at least, for, and I, I guess I would understand that some of the physical training part, the you know, uh, uh, combat kind of training, that kind of thing. I can understand where that might involve such close contact that you couldn't do it. But for the classroom part, anyway, I'm kind of curious as to why you're not, you're not, you know, back in the class now, so to speak. So in uh, an excellent question, the last session that we just had that just graduated, we, we did bring them back into the building. But we uh, and and we tried to be as as uh, close to operational as possible. Um, I, I can't um, part of part of the the normal course of duty is is uh, uh, that they're assigned a room and a roommate, and they're using common showers, common sinks. They're sleeping in very close proximity to each other. Um, uh, as you spoke to Representative Lynn, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the combat training, hand uh, defensive tactics training, ground fighting, uh, the exposure of OC, uh, where literally they're, they're coughing and spitting and, and we got to clean them up with uh, hoses and, you know, uh, water and stuff like that. Uh, they wear uh, protective equipment when we use simunition training. So these are closed masks, um, clear masks. Uh, so we're trying to do the best we can and at the same time mitigate uh, those kinds of situations where uh, we're using gang showers or we have them in close proximity, you know, sleeping together at night. Um, we, ultimately, this session, when it first began, uh, and with the, with the information that the, we were going to get a pretty big surge after the holidays and into the winter months and with the understanding that uh, police officers would be getting that vaccination uh, it was my decision to go completely remote try to keep the building as quiet as possible uh, get the staff vaccinated 
uh, get through the surge, make sure that the vaccination um, availability was such that the recruits would have an opportunity to get vaccinated if they wanted to. And uh, that was the reason that I had made that decision. Uh, believe me, uh, we, we really do wanna get back to business. Um, when we had the last class in, uh, our facility uh, is, is not equipped to seat the number of people we have to seat in a room to begin with on a good day. We have people right on top of each other. Uh, to maintain social distancing, we literally had to use two different lecture halls and we had to zoom the lecture uh, from one room into the other room. And then the instructors would walk up and down the hallway to just check on the two different groups. Were we able to do it? Yes, we were. Um, you know, best case scenario, no, it was not. It hasn't been best case scenario since I've been here. So, uh, but we, we are definitely working towards trying to get back to that normalcy, whatever that might be. Great, all right, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Are there any further questions for Mr. Scipio? Uh, I, I do have a question for, uh, is it Ms. Ames? who is on your uh, board? Yes, I, I promised her that she wouldn't have to answer, but I, I think she's gonna have to answer. <laughs> I'm here. Hi, Laura well, Lee. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Ames. Um, how, how long have you been on the uh, Police Standards and Training Board? Uh, I've been employed here since 1994. Okay, okay. All right. And, and Madam Chair, she uh, she is kind of my uh, my business agent and my HR person. Uh, she she's actually the real director of the police academy, but we're not going to admit that. So you never you never should. But I I know <laughs> I know from where you come. So <laughs> are are you happy with the? Um, people that are currently on your uh, your board? Yes, I think we have um, a good staff here. I'm not I'm not talking about the staff. I'm talking about what what's it called? The Police Standards and Training Advisory Council. R Representative Umberger, uh, Ms. Ames is, is a, a state employee. She's with the um, Police Standards and Training Council the agency. She's not a counselor, I don't believe, on the council. No, I'm on staff. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. But how about Mr. Scipio? Would you like to comment on that? I, I uh there there um literally has been um a, a uh, change in the membership of the council. Uh, and, and in fact, next week, we have our first council meeting with the new counselors uh, that have just been appointed by the governor. Uh, I, I certainly can speak to uh, the members of the council uh, that I have worked with since I've been here. And, and I can also comment on, on the counselors that have been newly appointed. Uh, at every turn, at every turn since I have been here, uh, I have received uh, tremendous support from the members of the council. Uh, each one of those members of the council recognize wholeheartedly uh, the importance of their position uh, and the gravity of the decisions that they make. Uh, they hold me accountable and I like that. And uh, they uh, specifically uh, will provide guidance, direction and answer questions anytime I, I need those types of things. Uh, and I have had uh, just an excellent relationship, uh, both personally and professionally with the members of the council when I first came in. Uh, there's a lot of new members uh, that are coming in uh, with the exception, I think of one uh, new member. I am familiar with all of the new appointees. Uh, I hold them in equal regard uh, and I look forward to working with them. I, I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, New Hampshire law enforcement, you know, collectively understands the importance of the mission of our agency and uh, every person that uh, is appointed to that board uh, 
fully supports our operation and uh, th they've just been excellent to work with uh, and, and um, very support. I can't say enough good things and not because they, I got an answer to them. They're just, they're good people to work with. I, I got that. Uh, Representative Bucco, you had a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so one of the, the big advantages that, that, that all, all, um, all municipal police departments uh, have centralized this centralized training. And but one of the big incentives is that they send their officers at no cost. Is that is that remain? Is that going to remain that way? The uh, uh, Representative Bucco, I can tell you unequivocally that I have worked in two different environments, uh, police training environments. I was a director of a police academy in Massachusetts. I was I was one of probably 15 police academies across the Commonwealth. Uh, and at every director's meeting that I would go to, they would always point north and say, we should be doing what New Hampshire's doing. We have to do what New Hampshire's doing. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's a tuition-based program. In other words, the, the police agencies and or the student themselves have to pay uh, a, a tuition. Now, it's a, it's a very modest tuition, and it clearly does not cover the cost of the, the, the academy. Um, Presently, and, and traditionally, since its inception, uh, the state has recognized here in New Hampshire that it's the responsibility of the state to make sure that our police officers are trained appropriately. And I think that's, that's always kind of been the vision, the way I understand it, is that this is a, um, a governmental responsibility, it's a public safety responsibility, and then the state uh, accepts that responsibility. Is there alternative ways that we could fund this? Uh, I imagine there are. Uh, I think that uh, you know we should we should always be forward leaning. We should always try to you know figure out is there a better way to do this? Is there is there a better way to cover the cost of this? Are there public private partnerships that that we can start to develop? Can we charge tuition? Uh, you know these are all discussion points that really need to be thoughtfully covered. Um, I, I would say you know, never say no to anything. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out if this is going to be, you know, a workable way to, to help, uh, you know, offset these, these costs that are in front of us. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Representative sir. Murray, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Skip, it's been fabulous talking with you. I have three questions particular to the budget. One is if there was one thing you could change in the budget, what would it be? And two, is there something missing? Is there a blue sky thing that you would love? I'm always optimistic about budgets. So is there one thing you would love to see that's not there? And just generally, are you happy? Let, me, a answer, let me answer the last question <laughs> first. Uh, I, I, um, I have been involved in New Hampshire law enforcement now for 32 years. Uh, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to have the job that I have right now. And uh, and I'm excited, uh, I am significantly excited about the challenges that are in front of us right now. And I tell my staff all the time, th these aren't things we have to do, these are things we get to do. The, we are going to be uh, making uh, such a tremendous difference for the citizens and the visitors of our state. So I'm very happy to be here and very excited to be here. Uh, to, to speak to, you know, if I could increase the staff, uh, the, my, my staff, uh, God bless every one of them, they, are, uh, they work hard every single day and the responsibilities that they have are, are far reaching. They teach uh, recruit classes, they have to, uh, you know, maintain their welfare of these recruits. They have to make sure they get fed, uh, th that they go through fitness training. They're delivering uh, classes. But then we also have a, the, the in-service component. We have to teach uh, in-service classes. We have to write curriculum. We have to put together facilitators guides. I have a, a bureau commander who's literally, uh, along with his staff, putting together uh, a brand new uh, record management system and learning management system. Uh, th they are uh, 
they're working really hard. And if I had the ability to snap my fingers and, and, you know, double the size of, of the staff here, uh, we could get significant things done. That is not a fiscally responsible thing for me to ask for. And, uh, and I would not ask for that. Um, cause I'm really happy with my job and I don't want to lose it. <laughs> uh, but you know, to that end, um, uh, I, I think my my staff, uh, at least when I'm around, they they share the same optimism and and excitement that I do. Uh, they know they're working hard. Uh, they know I'm in here trying to help them get the resources that they need. And um, you know, I, I I think you know at the end of the day, we are a service provider, much like any other police department, quite frankly. And the services that we provide. Uh, are so vitally important because we are literally training every police officer in the state to then go back to their communities and protect and serve the people who live in those towns. So, uh, and cities and, and on the highways and, and out in the woods, you know, uh, so it, it, it's uh, the actions of my staff and my organization are, are far reaching and, and vitally important to our state. So I, I, uh, if I could get more help, it would be awesome. Uh, but we will do the best we can with what we got, and we do a pretty darn good job right now. So, Representative Petrie, you have a question. You're you're muted, Joe. Good. Hit the right button. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Mr. Shipra. How do you measure the effectiveness of uh, your program, say, from five years ago to today and what we need to do? Because I believe that we have uh, probably the greatest uh, law enforcement people uh, in the country, uh, that state police, local police, very, very few people, uh, very, you know, you hear very few stories. Is it is it the amount of lawsuits we get or or what, how do you measure that? Uh, sir, I, I concur with your opinion wholeheartedly. I, I think we do an excellent job here in New Hampshire, New Hampshire law enforcement. I, I don't think that, uh, I think we collectively hold ourselves to a very high standard and, and we make, make sure that that standard is carried across the board. With regard to uh, measuring, uh, you know, are, are we doing the right thing? Are we, are we, providing the right training to, to make sure that these officers are going to be competent and professional when they, when they leave the academy. I, I'm really leaning hard on that job task analysis, which hasn't been done in a little while. Now, we are fortunate that we're a smaller state. Uh, we have some very forward-leaning um, police chiefs, uh, the colonel of state police. Uh, you know, these people are very uh, forward, uh, looking forward-leaning people. Uh, when they lead their agencies and, and working with those, with those uh, peers that I have, uh, I, I think, you know, despite or notwithstanding the fact that we've, we've been kind of, uh, I don't know, delinquent and not doing that JTA, I, I still feel very confident working with, with my peers that we're able to, to still uh, keep that high level of police services uh, going uh, here in the state. To, to, to put a measure on it, we're going to need to do that JTA, and then I'm, I'm going to need to sit down uh, and get those subject matter experts in here and make sure that we're, we're leading the way here uh, in New Hampshire. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, and, and to your point, sir, uh, we are only one of two states in the country that offers at a state level um, active bystandership in law enforcement training. Uh, I've committed the state of New Hampshire to this program. Uh, this program empowers uh, police officers to be able to step in and prevent misconduct uh, and, and to build a uh, stronger community trust. And um, it, we have uh, New Hampshire on, on the East Coast and we have the state of Washington is the only other state uh, in the country that is, has accepted this at, at a state level. So um, we're, we're doing the, we're, we're really trying to, to, you know, 
stay in front of and be an example for uh, New Hampshire uh, law enforcement. All right, uh, follow up, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, um, I had training, uh, matter of fact, over 50 years ago, and the big thing was common sense. That's what the chief told me, and that was it. He said common sense, and actually, uh, I have a meeting tonight with the daughter of one of the first graduates of the academy. So, which is which is kind of neat. I didn't, if, realize, I didn't realize it went that uh, went by that fast. 50 years. <laughs> Uh, yes. I, and, and, you know, to your point, um, common sense and treat people with respect. You, you can teach the academy in about, you know, two days and, and just treat people nice, do the best you can to help them and use common sense. And that, that is, if you don't have those things, you probably shouldn't be a cop, not in New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, I do have one, one further question, if I might. Uh, are you training correction officers at this time? Yes, ma'am, we are. And um, uh, that is one of our uh, missions. Not only do we run a full-time police academy and a part-time police academy, but we also uh, oversee the uh, Department of Corrections Corrections Academy. And um, uh, I know that Commissioner Hanks, uh, I work very closely with Commissioner Hanks, uh, you know, we, we, we wanna make sure that we're, um, we're addressing the needs of the Department of Corrections as well. Uh, we have uh, an excellent uh, commandant uh, at Police Standards and Training that oversees the program and some real excellent uh, corrections trainers that come from the Department of Corrections to put that academy staff together. Uh, we actually are in session right now with a full-time academy, a part-time academy, and a corrections academy as we speak. So all three of those are in session right now. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the uh, members of the committee? And Madam Chair, if I could speak to just one more item just to, to uh, make sure that it's, it's spoken to. It, if, you, if I could ask you to go to 1301, page 1301, at the very bottom, you're gonna see line 102 and that is uh, contracts for program services. And this is a new line item. And you'll see that it goes from zero to uh, over the biennium, $200,000. And this money um, has been added uh, through the governor's budget after consultation with LIAC after consultation with uh, Director Ken Norton of New Hampshire NAMI. And this money is specifically set aside to train police officers to respond to events where people are uh, suffering from a mental health crisis. You know, all too often, uh, and this is not just in New Hampshire, but nationally, uh, the police are called oftentimes because people don't know who else to call and uh, the police are called to uh, an event where somebody is suffering from a, a mental health crisis. And in fact, uh, their aberrant behavior may, uh, may necessitate a use of force. And, um, you know, we understand that uh, it is vitally important for police officers to have uh, a level of training so that they can interact effectively with people who are in crisis so that we can try to uh, de-escalate the, the issue in the first instance, take them into custody in a safer way with maybe not using uh, a level of force that is justified, but is there a better way to do this, right? And, and um, you know, to that end, I, I work very closely with Director Norton and, um, you know, he, he's spoken to me about, geez, is there any way that we can we really want police standards and training to start delivering this, this product and this training. Uh, I, I think it's very important. And I think it's important not only to the communities that we serve, honest to goodness, it's important for the police officers to have these tools too, because the police officers have to carry with them uh, the results of, of those actions that they take. And, and if there's a way that we can protect the, 
the mental health of the officer on top of that and, and allow them an opportunity to, to maybe take on a, a, an issue in a different manner, a different way based on this new training, then um, it's better for the community. It's better for the officer. The outcomes are just better. So uh, I, I did want to speak to that directly because, you know, this is, it's kind of a special earmark. I think it's important. It is expensive, but I think it's very important. And, and in the end, it serves the citizens of our state. So, uh, and, and Madam Chair, I, I stand ready for any, any further questions. Otherwise that would, that would conclude my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you noticed that we were pretty kind. <laughs> in our, in our yes, I'm sure. I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. Anytime. Um, I do want to ask, is there anyone that has not been over to the police standards and training area? Okay. It looks like everybody has done that at some time or other. And uh, it's always an eye-opening experience for um, the people, the representatives to actually see what, uh, what goes on over there. And, um, and I, you know, I, I thank the people at the Academy for putting up with us when we, uh, when we do come. So, <laughs> all right, if there, are no, if there are no further questions, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. And, um, I think all of the questions have been answered uh, and um, we will not be voting on your budget today, but um, I don't think that there's, from my perspective anyhow, that there's anything in here that we would um, have significant questions about. So I thank you and good luck in your new job. Madam Chair and uh, uh, members, uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I stand ready if, if there's any follow-up questions later on, if you want to reach out to me, I, I would be you know, happy to try to help answer or clarify anything. And please stop by. It'd be nice to you know, meet people face-to-face. -face, and I'm very proud about our operations. I, I'd love to, even if you've had a tour, we'll, we'll give you another one. So uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, I have about 11.15 and we have lottery coming in at 11.30. So um, get up, stretch, um, do whatever you need to do and we'll, uh, we'll see you back. Um, Mickey, do we want to leave this open or do we want to close it and come back or what? That's up to you. We, we've got this set up as a reoccurring webinar, so I can close it and open it back up anytime and you just click your same links to come in. Um, it's really whatever you want to do, whatever the committee wants. Well, as long as it can stay open, let's just leave it open and uh, we'll do whatever we need to do. By the way, we also need to introduce Andrea. That's right. Who has, who has uh, appeared on the screen, but uh, she's She's new to us, so if you would. I'll, I'll let An Andrea introduce herself, but basically she's a performance auditor with the LBA Audit Division, and she's going to be helping us out this session. Uh, as normal, we have uh, audit helpers, and, and she's been assigned to help with Division Two uh, matters this year. But Andrea, I don't know if you want to tell a little bit about the work you've done and how long you've been with the office. Uh, you're muted, Andrea. Yeah. There we go. Can everyone hear me now? Good afternoon, representatives. Um, I think Mickey well explained um, a little bit of my background. I've been with the office for about four years now, and I work in the audit division doing performance audits. Uh, division two is a lot of different agencies that I actually haven't worked on yet, so I'm actually really excited um, to get some exposure to education and uh, police and training standards and lottery, which I have not worked on not really much more to it. Um, I did work on the parole board audit. That was one big audit that I was on. So I guess that kind of speaks to a little bit of my time there. Thank you for having me. Thank you and uh, welcome to uh, division two. Thank uh, you. Mickey will be a great teacher. No question about it. No pressure. Yes, been so far. <laughs> so you want to keep the meeting open yeah, representative? Pardon? 
you want to keep the the zoom webinar live i'll just put up a shared screen just letting the public know that we'll be uh getting back together at 11 30. okay sounds good thank you so much
it uh, looks like we're all back. And um, I see that Mr. McIntyre has joined us. So I have pretty close to 1130. So Mickey, if you would uh, <clears throat> bring Mr. McIntyre back up or up and uh, then I think we can uh, proceed. Welcome, Mr. McIntyre. Good to see you again, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm Merck. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yourself? Very well, thank you. Very well. Good to see all the members of the committee as well. And uh, with me also is our uh, Chief Financial Officer, uh, Jim Duras, who is led into the meeting as well. Would you like me to start? Yes, please. Okay, certainly. Um, if I, I'll be sharing a screen briefly. Um, if I can do that and not screw it up. Um, obviously, the, um, I wanted to give a, a just a brief background uh, to the members of the division on the lottery uh, and its revenue. As you obviously are aware, the lottery is a, a, a revenue agency and uh, an enterprise account. Uh, and the budget process, while we're subject to the budget process, uh, the legislature doesn't actually appropriate any funds for us. It, we spend from our own revenue stream and, and are self-funded. And so um, for us, we really, as you can imagine, focus on the revenue side while obviously keeping track of the expense side. So I wanted to run through some slides real quickly, um, if I could. So this is our sales of games by the last 10 years. Obviously the takeaway from this slide is that the majority of what we sell in stores and the majority of our revenues come from scratch tickets. Um, over the last 10 years, over $2 billion in sales of them. Um, right now, our second biggest selling product is probably Kino. Uh, right now it's averaging over a million dollars a week uh, in sales, which is in excess of what we had estimated originally for revenue projections. This slide is um, a breakdown of our revenues by fiscal year for the last 15 years. Obviously, we are very proud of the fact that that number keeps going up and not down. Um, and this is just our, the gross number, which is an interesting number, but certainly not the most important one. Um, this is our scratch ticket sales, which is something we can control and have been actively promoting as our biggest product. It also has been growing over the last 15 years uh, significantly. Um, this is the graph for Powerball and Mega Millions. What this slide really is meant to demonstrate is that the revenues of these two products, which constitute a significant portion of our sales, are erratic because they are jackpot driven. And so as a result, jackpots drive sales. Uh, 2020, as you will see, was a very off year for that. We did not have any large jackpots which thankfully we had this year. We just in January had a very, very good month and two significant jackpots, which helped drive revenue. Um, this is Kino sales. Obviously it's a new product, but it has been growing. Uh, 2020, as you can imagine, we were faced with a problem in that uh, when bars and taverns were shut down, uh, so was Kino sales. So really March through June, we in uh, 2020 were sales were minimal. Uh, but this year, sales have rebounded dramatically. Uh, and as I suggested, we're doing on average now a million dollars a week. Uh, and so we expect it to continue to grow. Uh, and this is the important slide uh, and our last one. This is what our distributions education have been over the last 15 years and what they're projected to be this year as well as the out two years. Um, and as you obviously, we're very proud of the fact that in the last 10 years, we've essentially doubled sales uh, and doubled net profitability in education. Um, so those are the slides I had for you, um, uh, Chair Umberger. I don't know if you want any members want any questions regarding slides or revenues or want to sort of go in and um, our, our expenses and our budget request. I am out. Uh... Representative Murray, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I have another question. Um, where in the state do people typically play Keno? Is it a, is it distributed across the state? Is it more in the southern tier? Is it in the North Country? Where are these bars and restaurants that provide Keno? Um, it's across the state. 
in varied locations, um, mostly concentrated in the south and sort of south central. It's really the bulk of our sales come from Rocky and Hillsborough County, but that's true of all of our sales. I mean, our 60% of our revenues come from Rocky and Hillsborough County because there's a lot of folks that live there, as you can imagine. Uh, and lottery sales, one of the key variables is population density. Because if you live in the North Country, you may drive by a store once every few days. If you live in Manchester, you drive by a store, you know, 10 a day. And so your access to, avail to stores that sell our stuff and, you know, bars being located generally in large population density areas, um, that's where most of our sales are. Follow up, if I may. Please. Thank you. Um, I don't suppose you have any sense of out of state versus in state people who play. Uh, actually, oddly, it's a good question. Uh, in the process now of pulling that data, really the best way to do that is to look at the cash, the, the winning tickets that have been cashed and the state of residence for the winning tickets. Um, folks tend to play where they work, not where they live. Um, and, the, and there are towns that actually don't have a store, yet there's still folks that play there. Um, so, we're in the process of looking at that now. I do know we saw an uh, increase in revenues, particularly around the Lakes region during COVID, because I think a lot of folks have moved up there who had summer homes um, from Massachusetts. Uh, also for sports betting for us, we see about 12% of our revenues come from Massachusetts on the sports betting mobile platform. And I believe the majority of our revenues in the physical locations in Seabrook and Manchester from Massachusetts. Thank you. Representative Heath, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's been answered. Um, my question was um, with regard to the sports betting and how that's going and, and um, for the year, what did um, revenue look like from that? Actually, um, thank you for correcting me, I actually have just today, pull the new financials as of January. I can show them if you'd like. I would like to see that. Thank you. Oh, wrong one. Can you can you see the screen where it shows the Hampshire Lottery, the Hampshire Lottery Sportsbook revenue? Yes. So if you go to the far right section, it'll say combined. Um, handle, which is a column to the the far right block, but the far left column it says handle. That is the amount of money that's wagered. So if you and I bet $50 on the Patriots, me to lose, you to win, that would be $100 of handle, even though really my $50 went to you because you won and I lost. Gross gaming revenue is the amount left over after all of the people who have won have been paid. Mm -hmm. And state rev share is the amount each month that the state receives in revenue from sports betting. So if you go down to the bottom, uh, this fiscal year, we've handle has been $285 million gross gaming revenue has been 22 million and the state's share thus far has been 10.5 million, which is significantly better than we had anticipated when we made their first revenue estimates um, way back when. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. Well, I can, I, I, honestly, it was just prepared, finished today by our CFO and I was just looking at it before this meeting started. So wonderful timing. Thank you. Obviously, the uh, the revenue is uh, going very well, and um, and that's that's great for the education trust fund. We're we're excited about that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and actually, to that point, uh, Madam Chair, we um, our plan was for 110 million, and we raised guidance with Ways and Means in the governor's office to 120 million for this fiscal year, uh, and so that's obviously helping in terms of the budget issues we had from last fiscal year. And we have seen, like I said, we've seen an influx of revenues well over and above our comparator states like Maine and Vermont. And I think a large part of that has been uh, influx of citizens who are playing up here now. Mass citizens, I mean. Uh, can you tell me how um, historical horse racing went in ways and means? Um, it went okay, I think. Uh, obviously, 
a hearing where I think 180 people signed up <laughs> um, is tough in this times. Uh, I think they're going to have a couple of work sessions going forward. Um, and it, I think it went okay. Um, other, your, your colleagues obviously could tell you differently, but um, I think it went fine. Certainly for us, it's, I mean, I, I, I think we've made the case a number of times that um, for us, it's how far do you want us to be on the dial of gambling? And we're happy to be there and do the best we can. We don't really sort of support or oppose legislation like that because it's a policy decision. I, I often say that we don't make policy with the instruments of policy. You tell us what to do and we try to do the best we can. Go ahead, Representative Heath. Thank you. I forget sometimes to technology wise to raise my hand, but I, my hand automatically goes up. Um, a question um, uh, with regard to historical racing. Um, that's something we've been talking about now for a, a few years. Um, what would your projection be, in fact, if we were to um, uh, uh, adopt historical racing? So um, I had made revenue estimates. Um, attached, is a fiscal note attached to the bill? Um, if I recall, I don't have it in front of me, I think that charities would realize an additional 5 million and the state would realize an additional, I think it was 13 million. Uh, but certainly those numbers are fluid in the sense of it's your call as to how much you want each side to get. If you want the state to get more or less, it, you know, that number is not really tied to anything here. It's just the way the bill was drafted and our revenue estimates there from um, if the charities want to get more and we get less, then that's, you know, or you want to state to take it all, it's your call. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Charlie, would you? Oh. Uh, sorry, Matt. Mayor Chair, you got cut off. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Heath, did you have a follow up question? I do. I do. Um, and I'm, I apologize. Um, thank you so much uh, for taking this question. Um, in terms of charitable gaming, um, there are um, there's oversight for that purpose. And I know that there was um, some kind of a study done that um, recommended the number of people um, to really oversee charitable gaming. Um, is that your department or do you know nothing about that? It's my department, Representative. Um, that was merged. It wasn't originally. But in 2016, 17, uh, the governor put into her, her budget, Governor Hassan, and it was approved by you folks, the, the absorption of charitable gambling to the lottery. Uh, and and they, they went a few years. Have, How many people do you have overseeing uh, charitable gaming? Um, in some cases, there's some people who do it part time, like our CFO does the numbers, obviously. Uh, he does all of our math and it's his department. Um, but directly, it's approximately 11. It's either 10 or 11 people to oversee charitable gambling. Um, there's three investigators we're hiring. There's a fourth investigator hiring a fifth. We have five financial auditors, um, which is significantly more than we have when we absorbed the agency. I think they at the time they only had one. Uh, so we have significantly greater oversight than we ever had before. Uh, if, and that's your question, Representative. Yes, thank you very much. I will, I will just comment that um, I was involved in uh, one of the charitable gaming sessions and um, the state does a, a very good job in making sure that uh, both the charity and the operator uh, are, um, are, are, are good. You can't, you can't just, uh, say, well, yeah, let's do that tomorrow. So it's, uh, they're doing, a, in my opinion, anyhow, a very good job uh, with the charitable gaming. So uh, Representative Bucco, you had your hand up. I did, my question was asked and answered, thank you. Okay. Um, Representative McIntyre, uh, Representative, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McIntyre, uh, you, yeah, whatever. You sure you don't want to run for state rep? Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, do you want to go through your current expenses? Certainly, um, happy to do it. The um, 
this year, our you'll see our expenses are a, a significantly larger than they were last year um, in a couple of areas. One, obviously, is um, personal services. We did hire a few more people because we have been growing, as you can see. Um, growth comes with a cost, right? And so one of the things I'd like to sort of point out is the net profit on the slide that's up on the screen, that's our last slide, is net of expenses. And so that growth is, these expenses are netted out of that profit. And so, you know, as we grow more, we have to spend more. Um, there's a couple of expenses which look odd and I'll go through. Um, one is um, the uh, current expenses, which in this fiscal year is 682 and drops down to 402 uh, in 405 in 2022 and 2023. That was in place to essentially pay for our own hosting of sports betting if indeed we were going to do that, which we didn't end up doing. So um, even though that figure is 682, we won't spend anywhere near it because we weren't sure if we were going to be the hosting entity for sports betting, meaning we had to build out a server room and, IC and uh, internal control, which we did not have to do, or the expenses that went with it, as well as sort of the support that goes with it. Um, because of our partnership with DraftKings, they really handle all the expenses there. Um, and so forth. So as a result, we don't need to spend as much money. Um, the request out years 402, 500, and then 405, 500. Current expenses pays for a number of expenses. One of which is obviously that the LBA audit bill we pay, which is about 75,000 annually, comes out of that fund. Um, what we pay for to support the retail network, all of the point of sale materials we send out is paid from that line item. Uh, and so it's a big expense for us, but certainly it's an important one because it supports our retail network. Um, transfers to OIT is certainly their um, number, what, it, what we think, what they think they're gonna spend supporting us. Uh, it's obviously a fluid number depending on what our needs are. Um, I don't know whether, whether expense sort of promotional, I know is a big item. If you'll see in 2020, uh, we only spent 2.068 million. And this year we're project, projected to spend 2.5. And the reason for that, I'll relate back to the slide a few ago where I showed you Powerball and Mega Millions being very low in 20. That's due to low jackpots. And we don't promote low jackpots because it's not worth it. And so we spend, when the jackpots hit $300 million and $400 million, we spend a lot of money on TV and radio promoting those jackpots because we see a return of a, a significant return on investment. It's like 10 to 1. But if there's not, we don't spend it and therefore it lapses. And obviously, if we don't spend it, it lapses because our um, revenues are net of expenses. So if it doesn't get spent, it's a profit education. And those are set by the terms of actually the Constitution. That formula is in second part, Article 6B of the, of the state constitution. And so um, I'd like to think, uh, and I'll use this analogy, I'd like to think we act like grownups when it comes to our budget. Um, we never generally spend up to the budget only because if we don't need to, we don't spend it. Like 2020, we only spent $9.25 million despite being authorized for a significantly higher number. And so, uh, in some cases, these are here just in case we, we need to spend it and want to capture every re other revenues we can. Um, and I know there's another, um, Jim, you want to talk about our prioritized request? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so our original, um, our original budget that we submitted for DOIT expense, uh, we at, had additional prioritized requests in there for a CNR, CRM system, uh, which is a bit large project. So we, we actually originally budgeted 513,000 with an additional 220,000, I'm rounding off, for the CRM project going forward over the next few years. This is a plan that our sales team put together in order to better gather information about our customer base, uh, responses, information we receive, and requests for information we receive to try to streamline our systems. 
Um, so the governor did add it into our our um, into the governor's recommended budget, which our sales team was very happy about. And if I could sort of add color to that, um, we've added multiple new channels to our offerings. So for example, we have an internet lottery program and that goes customers come through us from one method. We have the DraftKings sports betting platform. Those calls come through us for another method. Obviously we have our traditional lottery. Those calls come into us. And then now we have Kino and those calls come into us. So we're not doing a very good job of tracking our customers who call in and making sure they get response times as fast as we would like them to. And so that's really what the, the priority the request is for is to make sure we're servicing the folks who quite literally pay our salaries um, well and making sure nobody falls through the cracks. The, you know, the I didn't get a call back drives me insane if I hear that. So um, I want to make sure we don't slip, slip, slip and fall on that. So that's, that's, the, that's the request. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has on our, on our budget. It's a pretty straightforward civil budget, I think. Thankfully, there's no no grants, no no federal money. There's just, I always get those emails. I'm like, I, I just literally, it's from sales. It's from the sale of tickets. I, uh, I, did, I did have a question. Um, I noticed that your uh, health insurance has dropped. Have you uh, done something different there? Jim? Those numbers are provided to us from DAS. Um, I can tell you that our original amount for the year, I'm trying to zoom to it here, bear with me. Um, our original amount for the year was actually that we originally requested was actually higher for 2022. And it was decreased on the uh, governor's version. Um, and the same or excuse me and the exact opposite for 2023 so those are numbers provided by das uh, nothing that we calculate here same as with salaries it would roll right along with salary figures through through uh, them okay i guess I, I i knew that i should have not said that yeah i'm assuming uh, they made an adjustment in some way on their end of how they're handling things sort of yeah. like we've seen opeb and everything we've seen adjustments there over the last couple of years because of changes they've made so that's yeah. my assumption yeah because of our actually absorption of racing we picked up all of the racing employees who had retired previously as well so that had jumped up a few years ago significantly and you said that with the uh, um DOIT transfer, it's because of a, a new system that you're implementing? Yes, it's, it's, um, it's called CRM, which stands for Customer Relationship Management Tool. It's an ability for essentially software to track all of our relationships and all of the calls and emails we receive from customers, of which, as you can imagine, we receive a lot. It also allows you to... Uh data mine to gather data and to create reports and and analyze things so that you have a better understanding of your sales okay i see a couple of hands and i'm sorry i don't know who was first representative heath thank you madam chair and um thank you for taking my question i live in manchester uh manchester uh <laughs> we have a lot of terrible game going on in my city and Kino seems to be quite a hit. Um, do you have any um, figures or do I need to wait for the CRM system to come on board before you can tell me exactly how much money do you think the city of Manchester drives to the state of New Hampshire? Um, I can find that out for you. I don't have the number right now because I don't have it broken out by city. Uh, obviously, as you can imagine, Manchester being the large, largest in the state, uh, but also, I, um, a commercial base as well mm -hmm. is probably larger than its population in terms of revenue growth, mm -hmm. revenue uh, from the lottery. Um, but I'd have to get the number for your representative. I'm happy to do it. It just will take a little bit. All right. Thank you very much. Representative Murray, you have a question? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I should have lowered my hand. You asked the question that I was going to ask. So I'm good. <laughs> what do they say? Great minds think alike. Is Absolutely. that right? There you go. 
Are there um, any further questions for uh, Mr. McIntyre? Uh, uh, I'll call you Charlie. I'm Please. sorry that I can't get Kino passed in Conway. It's uh, it's absolutely a losing cause, and it must be because Representative Bucco doesn't want it. I don't know. <laughs> I enjoy the drive anywhere, Representative Bucco. I enjoy the drive up every time. Uh, it's one of the places I actually personally make sure I go to. Um, it would be great, especially now during ski season. The bars would be well, whatever. I, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can uh, wait a couple, three years and see what happens. But Representative Bucco, it seems like you want to say something. Well, I just wanted to, re can you, am, am I on? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that remark that I, I was out there trying to promote it just as much as you. <laughs> yeah, I think last time it got in with the bathwater in terms of uh, other issues. Yeah, I, I don't understand it either, but. Certainly, when we saw the first initial fear for Kino, I, I get it, folks were reluctant to vote for it, but we haven't had so much as a single call related to a problem with it in terms of any issue at a bar or a tavern, and most of the bars that have it love it, and we did a study after the fact that I've used a couple of times in presentations, the, all of the bars saw a lift between 5 to 25% in their other stuff. Yeah. So they sold more food, they sold another beverage, another dessert. So sure. um, one of the bar owners put it to me like, it was the first time I felt like the state did something for me versus, you know. <laughs> so um, I and bringing you know. in a million dollars a week is, it make, makes a big difference too. You know, originally it was only about eight or nine million. Yeah, no. So, you know, we, we had estimated 40 million when we first did the estimates, revenue estimates, and now it's going to be like 50 million at least uh it's continuing to accelerate so and like i said we're seeing it most along the border uh, and then the bigger cities as you can imagine and one of the things it does actually is it makes the bar more valuable if you wanted to sell it right okay are there any further questions for mr mcintyre yes can go I ahead rep Cindy. Thank you. Um, I just have to ask this question in terms of um, problem gambling. Uh, are, are, are you seeing um, or do you know or can you identify um, an increase in problem gambling based on um, the COVID pandemic and um, all the offerings that we have now available to the state? I, certainly, um, there's a council on problem gaming um, that tracks data. I, we don't as a matter, uh, we're the funding source. Um, one of the nice things is because of technology, the, both the sports betting platform as well as our internet platform, both have tools which allow the player to help themselves in essence, to either limit the amount they spend as well as exclude themselves. We have hundreds and hundreds of people who've excluded themselves both from sports betting and internet um, that we don't have the ability to do at a store. Um, you know, if that makes sense. Stopping somebody from buying a lottery ticket is the equivalent of stopping somebody from buying a cup of coffee statewide, which is not possible. So, you know, technology allows us to do that. Representative Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you speak to Kino and the places that have it and the places that don't have it? Does this get revisited? Um, are there communities that don't have it that it comes back up for another vote? And have there been communities that have decided they don't want it anymore? <laughs> Um, we yes, tried that yes, a couple yes. of times. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were places that initially really wanted it very badly, uh, and where uh, the sponsors were bars in the towns and cities that really wanted to have it. And those were really along the mass border because Mass has Keno, and the biggest locations for Keno in Massachusetts and coincidentally in North America are on the Mass New Hampshire border three of the top five in North America are on the border. So bars there really excited to get it, as you can imagine. So they were really first jumped to it. And, and then there were places which were unsure, didn't vote for it the first time and voted for it the second time. And then there are places where it will never happen to the end of time as long, you know, just won't happen. Um, so, you know, I'd never say never, never say always, but I would be, there are certain, like Portsmouth, for example, has been dead set against it 
since it it started. So um, I because we've hit our revenue target, I stopped really going out and soliciting the vote. We never really campaigned for it like you would like you folks do. <laughs> Um, we just would go out and answer questions at the town meetings. Um, I saw a few, obviously a bunch of you folks in uh, your towns and cities. Um, but no, we, there's no, I don't think there are any cities or towns that have it on the ballot coming this fall. But are there any places that have it and decided it was a bad idea? No. No. And honestly, I, I haven't heard even like a selectman or a, or a city councilor say, say, say likewise. Are there any further questions that anyone has? Or Senator Lynn, did you have a hand up? All right, seeing I'm nothing. I'm sorry, I did not. <laughs> sorry. Okay, no problem. I've got this little white hand at your head, so. Um, oh. <laughs> So um, if there are no further questions, um, our next um, area that's coming in is uh, Fish and Game at 1.30. And so um, we'll have an opportunity for lunch. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre, for giving us that. And um, we will... Uh, come back together at 1.30. And uh, Mickey, I assume that we probably should sign off. And- um, Yeah, I think considering it's you know 90 minutes, I'll probably shut down the webinar and then just start it back up again, probably around 1.25 and everyone can re-enter again. Do we, yeah, do we have to, do we have to show something that says we're in recess until 1.30? That's up to you. I mean, it's uh, we can figure out something. It's just it occupies the screen for um, 90 minutes now that I've got to keep the my computer kind of shared screen. But I can do that if you want. I know other committees have been doing that. Um, I don't know if it's a rule of the house that that you have to keep the webinar open or if we can just you know end it and then restart it again. I think it's really up to you. Whatever you'd like to do. I don't. I don't have any idea. No one has. Uh... I mean, it's considering you've got a uh, fishing game posted at 1.30, the public will know you're getting back together at 1.30. I think if it was an open-ended recess, like if you took a break and tell, you know, I could put something on the screen that says is currently in recess because it's unknown when you're coming back. Um, so it's up to you. I mean, I can put it like an away message up now that says division two is in recess until fishing game at 1.30. If you'd like that, just in case anyone pops in. Um, I'm not expecting folks to, um, we have uh, two, two attendees right now and one of them is Janet and she knows what we're up to. So um, <laughs> I don't think there's gonna be many folks of the public looking for division two in the next 90 minutes, so. Okay, I think that's probably the best thing and we'll, uh, we'll come back about uh, 125 and uh, hope everyone has a, a good lunch and um, we'll see you then. Thank oh, you yes, Mickey. Representative Mickey. Murray. Mickey, do you think we can get Charlie's slides? I think he's already gone. I wanted to ask if he could email us his slides. You, uh, I emailed him to you this morning. So you Charlie, should- you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then just a reminder on, on our LBA page, we do have that division two. So anything that I get, handouts, presentations throughout this session, I'm gonna throw them right online. So you, and you know, sort them chronologically. So you'll be able to refer back if you can't put your hands on something. Okay, yeah, I got police standards, but I've no, I don't have- well, the, Actually, lottery may have come yesterday. I think I sent lottery to you yesterday. All right, I'll find it. Thank you. Representative Lynn, you have a question? Yes, you know, I, I just wanna make sure that I'm, I'm performing my duties as clerk as I'm supposed to be. So the first question, the first uh, question I have is, um, I, I got from the, from Clerk Smith, two forms to be used at, you know, one of them, the, the one which I thought was the one for attendance. But as I look at it more closely, it, it really seems to be a form that's to be used if we're actually voting on some particular bill. And so I'm wondering, is there another form that I don't have that you use to take attendance? Uh, 
uh, Mickey, do you want to, I think it's just the, uh, there's just one form for uh, taking attendance. And normally Janet should give you, or somebody should give you the, um, the sheets for voting. Okay. I, I do have, I think I do have the sheet for voting, but I, I, and I, the last time I used that as to, because I, I didn't realize that I used that for taking attendance, but if there's another form for taking attendance, I, I, I guess I don't have it and I don't know, I don't really know if there is one. I'll have uh, Janet or maybe Representative Buco knows because he clerked for us last term. Yeah, well, so the attendance sheet used to come on a red clipboard, so it was a separate sheet. I can have Janet connect with you, Representative Lynn, and make sure you've got the proper documents because she's the one who collects all those for the you know, the minutes and the oh. clerk's file. So I'll have Janet connect with you to make sure you've got the right stuff. Great, thank you. And then just one other question, and this is probably the more important one is, um, I've I've been taking notes, so to speak, as 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 we've had the two presentations, and is I, I guess what I'm really asking is what do I do now? Am I supposed to like write up a little a little report, so to speak, about what they said, or what what do I do now? <laughs> uh, yes, a little report. I mean, okay. with uh, you know, as we're going through these um, budget hearings you know, we'll be talking about a lot of things, but uh, Janet, we just need to put in the file, you know, kind of a general statement about what occurred during, um, during okay. these sessions. And um, the other question when you're talking to Janet is we need to figure out how all of these handouts are going to get into the file because that is, that is the place where we keep records for however many years. But uh, Janet should be able to figure that out with you. So, and, so Madam Chair, I, I would just, uh, I, I would take my hand scribbled notes down the hall and hand them to Janet and she would type everything up. So um, <laughs> I don't. I didn't. Submit, I didn't ha submit a summarized report. I gave her actually the the, the uh, scribbled notes. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm. I think I might try that at some point when we're when we're like you know in person. But um, my my, I've never been known for having very clear handwriting. Yeah, well, I can't <laughs> read my own either. So, <laughs> so I think I, would, I might try at least in the first instance to type up a little something. I just asked Janet what she needs. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she she uh, she will definitely uh, tell you what she needs, and uh, but we do need to figure out how we're going to um, get all this stuff into the file, and I think that it will be probably obviously a little bit later on when we start getting uh, written testimony from. Um, people that want to want to speak yeah. um, that will become it's not a problem because it will get it but we just need to know how to get it into the file right okay all right great well thank you very much not a problem so we'll see everybody about 125 take care great.
Washington is wonderful. I think it just, this is running more smoothly than I ever imagined. And you keep it going. I am, I think we have the best division. <laughs> no, oh, there's no question in my mind, Mary. <laughs> Excuse me, I got a phone ringing here. And this has worked so well. I miss kind of the kibitzing and, you know, note sharing and chit chat afterwards. And just, you know, the small talk with the, um, the people coming in. I but know. this has worked so well. I don't think we would have had, I'm not sure we would have met with Tuesday with the ice storm. I know. I'm not sure I would have wanted to drive. And it was worse where you guys are than it was here. I we think might not have great. had that meeting on Tuesday if we hadn't had Zoom. That's right. So I think it's working really well. I just, um, I feel real comfortable. I'm anxious to hear Fish and Game because um, they've had such a good year but due to COVID actually. They're amazing. Yeah. It sounds like lottery really, um, I don't want to say benefited, but um, the revenues did come up from it. Yeah. And, and drinking and tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> Sit at home and drink. <laughs> Let's hear it for the vices. There you go. Right. That's what we got. What New Hampshire lives on. <laughs> Karen, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you know, your chair. Sometimes I like to ask questions just because I want to know something a little bit more. It's not necessarily related to, you know, something specific in the, the budget, but it's something that provokes a question in my mind from the budget. And sometimes it leads to an inter interesting conversation, but I don't know how comfortable you are with that. I'm comfortable with anything you want to ask. Okay, thank you. You know, we're, that's, uh, that's one thing I try to make sure we keep it open to whatever it is. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you not to ask something if it's something that you want to know. Well, some of, it's, some of it is so interesting and I learned so much. I yeah. love finance for that reason. This budget process is just intriguing and I love it so much because I've learned so much about New Hampshire. And then Mickey, I, Mickey is a star. He is so fabulous. I think we have the best LBA person ever too. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey is but, a state. Good. Yeah, you also, you have to also understand that he is extremely patient. Yeah. <laughs> Just glad to help. <laughs> Extremely patient. Okay, uh, Fish and Game, page 596, okay. I don't see anyone from Fish and Game here yet. Um, there is no handout, so if you're looking for one in your email or anything, they they didn't have one for today. So um, I think they're just going to speak to the governor's recommended budget document. Now they have a new commissioner, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Scott Mason. Okay. I don't I don't know him at all. Scott Mason. Got my tea. Yeah, Kathy Labonte has been at, with Fish and Game for a while as the, um, the money person. Is that who we're going to hear from today? We're going to hear from Scott okay, good. Mason. So, uh, Mickey, does it look like Fish and Game doesn't want any money? <laughs> they don't need a lot. No. I have, uh, it looks like I have Representative Spillane here with his hand raised. I can bring him in. Maybe he has something to share for everybody. Okay, I don't see his hand raised. Go ahead. Representative Spillane. Is Janet on the call? Hi. How is everybody? We're fine. I just wanted to let you know that uh, that uh, as Fish and Game Committee members, we are also interested and in watching for this. We've been working with uh, the Fish and Game Department, and uh, they're doing a fantastic job, as you all know. Uh, it's, it's been amazing uh, that they've been able to do everything that they've done through this COVID epidemic, and uh, and they're holding everything together. Um, I don't know how long it'll take for them to jump on, but we're e extremely interested in what they have to say and uh, looking forward to their numbers. 
aren't we all Mickey, the chair you... the, the chair uh, tim lang is also on and he he uh, may have his own things to say but i wanted to to uh, let you know that you know we're we're interested in the process and we're we're watching and and uh here to uh facilitate if there's any need for us okay thank you uh mickey do you happen to have their phone number yeah let me uh, let me give them a call uh, okay uh, would you like to hear from Representative Lang? He has his hand raised too. And... If he would like to speak, we might as well fill in the uh, the gap here. Okay. I'll bring him in. Okay, thanks. Representative, okay. Hey, Representative Berger, I just wanted to let you know, I did reach out to Scott Mason and remind him he had this meeting. So I already texted him and let him know. Oh, you did. Okay. Well, I'm sure he didn't forget. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask one thing. Can you tell me the page number again in the governor's bill? I'm trying to catch up to where you guys are. I missed the number. Yeah. Page 596. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I was looking for that myself. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, Mickey will talk to somebody over there and see what's going on. So let's see, um, I guess we're, uh, what's today? <laughs> Today's Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not meeting again until Monday. And Monday we have uh, safety and transportation coming in, I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, the 26th, um, we have the, uh, you, is it the, yeah, the university systems coming in. And um, what I, what I want to talk to them about is not so much their budget because I personally have no problem with what the governor has uh, outlined in uh, 2022. But what I do want to talk about is this uh, consolidation of the two systems. And I am particularly interested, of course, in um, what HB2 has to say about that. But I know we all listened yesterday and the governor sure didn't say much else <laughs> than what he had said before. Um, and so I, uh, I, am, I am a little nervous about how, how we want to proceed with that. And um, when I was, uh, I was talking to uh, Catherine Paventure, um, I guess, you know, I don't know. Uh, we, need to, we need to look very carefully because just by just combining the two boards doesn't solve anything because there's, um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, uh, RSAs that deal with the uh, with the two two systems, and uh, you can't you can't just say voila without digging into and figuring out how all that's going to work. And the other half of the problem is that in uh, 2023, the governor is only giving a pot of money. Uh, to the to the two systems, so it's um, it's going to be very complicated for us. And I have uh, briefly spoken to um, Representative uh, Ladd to try to see what his thought process is on that because it is a huge policy issue. And I think you also know that there is a public higher education committee. Uh, Mary, are you on that or? I was the last session, yes, I was. Oh, okay, well, I've been appointed to that this time and I don't remember who the other person is. Um, I didn't get appointed, so I'm off, mm -hmm. I, but it's a wonderful group. Yes, I know, I know. So I don't know if we wanna think about challenging them to put this together. But my real concern is that um, what any, any legislation that gets submitted 
more than likely wouldn't be effective until 1 July of 22, which would put the um, both systems in kind of a, uh, a catch 22. So anyhow, I just, I would just like people to be, um, you know, prepared for that discussion, whatever, wherever it leads, because the governor didn't say, you know, he did say the legislature could say no. You know? This is potentially a multi-year process and that it's not something that you just flip a switch and, and one, they just go work together. Oh, gee, you think? <laughs> I agree, so Multiple moving parts of how, so I would, I think it seems, I would have expected there to be a, like a process paper or a white paper to explain how yep. this would work over time. And I expect there may needs to be, if we do this, and it has some merit, you know, I'm open to listening to it. Yeah, that, well, um, there may need to be some expenditures in order to help pull these, all these different elements together. Yeah, well, that's that's what our job is going to be to try to sort all that out. So Madam Chair. That's, that's why I asked that you get your thinking caps on. So let Madam us turn. Chair, if I could, Madam Chair, if I could bring us back to fishing game for one more second. Yeah, I did want to. I did want to comment that one of the things that's in the budget that's extremely important to us in Fish and Game uh, and has been a, a, a contentious uh, issue for many, many years now is the powder mill fish hatchery. Uh, they have designated money to do a fix to the outflow. Uh, since Fish and Game is not here, I guess I will take it upon myself to speak to that a little bit in the fact that- yeah. uh, Jim, they, Jim, they are here. Oh, okay, great. Okay, and we've I'm been waiting think... for that in our department. We've been waiting for that, and we have constantly been answering questions from people on that. And and we've finally seen a resolution and a and a an expenditure, and we're happy to see that in our department. Okay, uh, Commissioner Scott, welcome. We have not met before, uh, Kathy. I'm glad to see that, as always, you are you are there, and. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd like you to uh, introduce yourself and provide us with your thoughts on the governor's budget. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Executive Director Scott Mason, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Um, as guardian of the New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife and Marine Resources, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department works in partnership with the public conserve, manage, and protect these resources and their habitats, inform and educate the public about these resources, provide the public with opportunities to use and appreciate these resources. Due to COVID-19, more and more people have chosen to recreate in the out of doors. This year, we've seen an increase in almost every service we provide to the people of New Hampshire. Like all state agencies, we have tightened our budgets due to the economic impacts that COVID is, is having on our state resources. It will be very hard for us to meet all the historic needs and these increased needs that citizens are currently asking for with the budget that we have proposed. While I've only been here for a few short months, it has become very apparent to me in this short period of time, the department is, is critically resource challenge from both a personnel side and a financial side. We have 192 full-time authorized positions, including myself. This budget includes 10 unfunded positions, including four conservation officers, two biologists, a hatchery, hatchery supervisor, and two staff in our public affairs division and, and, and uh, landowner relations. Each and every one of these positions are crucial to our mission. Um, in 20, in fiscal year 2020, we ended with a $7.6 million um, um, fun, uh, a fishing game fund. Uh, unusually high revenues in the spring of 2020 due to the pandemic, this, this has been recognized nationally. Currently, fiscal year 2021 overall budget is proposed at 34 million, 2022 and 2023 at 33.85 million and 35.12 million respectively. Keeping in mind there are 27 pay periods in the second year of the, of the biennium. 
Uh, general fund appropriations have helped the fishing game fund over the last four bienniums. Our budget request has $600,000 $600, each year of general fund money, 100,000 in match to our non-game program uh, per RSA 212B colon six two and 500,000 to law enforcement AU 7887. The governor's budget director provided us with a figure of 1.2 million over the, over the biennium to us. Um, our inland fisheries division recent, our in, inland fisheries division chief recently has given notice of his resignation. His departure has increased the pressure on the department as we look to solving the problems of powder mill hatchery. The departing division chief has previously held both the position of hatchery supervisor and has been serving as chief in both capacities since 2013. Those are my opening statements. And if you folks have any questions. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? Uh, yes, uh, Representative Heath. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and, and, and thank you um, for taking my question. Um, from my, what you suggested is that uh, Fishing Game has had a really strong revenue. Could you just talk about that a little bit? How, um, what areas that you saw the huge increases, and how you um, how you were able to uh, provide uh, support and resources for the um, multitude of people that came through our state taking advantage of our wonderful resources? <laughs> well, we, um, you know, when the pandemic struck in, in, the, in the spring of the year, uh, we saw a marked increase in license, you know, license sales. Um, that continues through the summer with increased uh, ATV and, or, or I should say, OHRV uh, registration fees. Um, the other thing that took place is we saw a marked increase in um, hunting license sales early in the spring. Uh, for those of you, uh, uh, we have a spring turkey season. So quite often, uh, folks that don't turkey hunt may wait till the end of the year to buy their license. But this year, a lot of them uh, had time in the spring to try turkey hunting. So we sold uh, a rather large increase in, in not only turkey permits, but also in, in, in hunting licenses in the spring. Um, we, we have healthy uh, herds and flocks in New Hampshire of, the, of our species that, that are hunted. Um, we have had, uh, we have a very decent program for our hatchery uh, trout program, and we have uh, good warm water resources, warm water fish resources. And I don't believe that the increased pressure has caused any negative impacts. Um, it certainly is an uptick, but the other thing that goes on, and, and anybody that hunts or fishes can explain to you, um, you don't have a, it, it take, it, it's not something that, that, that you necessarily go do the first day and become very successful. Now, there are, there are times that you're very successful on that first day, but a lot of times it takes, you know, multiple trips out to the woods before you actually get your first turkey. Um, or fish or whatever, whatever you're, you're after. Um, but the other thing that took place is with all these extra people in the woods, that meant, you know, more people were out hiking and that meant we, we probably, I haven't, we have not run the actual final statistics. So I, I would hesitate to say that we actually saw an uptick, but we did seem to be spending a little bit more time looking for lost souls. Um, and we had some um, rather horrendous, you know, issues this, this, past summer uh, with some of our lost souls in the woods. Um, and uh, that's continued into this year with, I'm sure you guys read the newspapers about some of the accidents and some of the lost folks we've been dealing with through the winter. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it, that does, it, you know, it's an expensive process for Fish and Game to, to supply those services. Representative Petrie, you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, <clears throat> search and rescue, uh, we have a, people who pay into that fund. And how does that, uh, that, that budget, how does that look like uh, as far as expenditures? Um, 
we that was something else that we saw record sales on. Um, I'm sure you folks are familiar with the hike safe card. And um, I don't, Kathy, do you have the numbers pulled out? I do actually. I have the final report for search and rescue that was submitted to fiscal committee as of June 30th. And I can do a breakdown of those revenues for you. The hike safe card that was implemented a few years ago has enjoyed much more success than I think was originally anticipated. And the hike safe card for fiscal year 20 actually um, brought in $165,795 in revenue. The agency response fee, which is that fee that is paid to us for people who have been deemed negligent that we have had to rescue was $22,423. And the remaining balance, which is fees and donations, which is kind of a, a melting pot. Of course, there's $1 for every snow machine and OHRV registration, as well as every boat registration that goes into this pot. And that was $197,000, $184.50. So for the second year in a row, the search and rescue account actually closed out in the positive, which we have not seen in a very long time. We closed out with a po positive balance of $171,708.35 for fiscal year 20. And I brought this with me because there's always questions about search and rescue. I know you're always interested in that. <laughs> And uh, representative, yeah. oh. just, I was just going to point the committee to page 627 of the governor's budget document, and you'll see those figures that Kathy just uh, discussed for fiscal 20. So there's a separate accounting unit uh, for search and yes. rescue. So just so you can crosswalk from her uh, explanation to the budget document. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, maybe you could... Uh forward that to um, Janet or Mickey so that we can get that in the record because this is a, uh, so, I mean, it's <laughs> so unusual to have this area actually in the plus column. This document is actually a fiscal committee report that I file with the fiscal committee on a quarterly basis. So it's already gone through the LBA, but if you would like for me to forward it over there again, I can certainly do that. Yeah, I would I would appreciate that so that, no okay, our, our committee doesn't necessarily get all of the information that goes to fiscal. So, certainly. yeah, uh, I need, if I could, I wanted to ask a question about the, um, the hike safe cards. Does this also cover skiers or it, or do we have a similar program for skiers, the backcountry people that seem to be having a lot of trouble this year? We don't have a specific program for skiers, but yes, if a skier bought a hike safe card, I mean, part of backcountry skiing, you know, it's, it's, it's partially hiking, it's partially skiing, you know, you're hiking up to, to ski back down. Uh, there's no reason why they couldn't buy a hike safe card. Um, uh, the other thing, and people don't understand sometimes, but part of your hunting license and fishing license, and that's where Fishing Game gets started looking for people, is 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 they will go get you if if you're out hunting or fishing, they'll they'll go find you if you don't come home, and uh, it it's um, to, to the best of our ability. Um, but uh, that's included in the price of a hunting or fishing license. So um, if somebody has a fishing license, then they're somewhat protected under that, that same premise. We lost the sound, I think. Oh. We can't uh, hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't have my, I was still on mute. Uh, Representative Bucco, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, at my at first glance at the source of funds, I see that um, you've, you've been able to cut down on the use of general funds by almost two thirds and, and more than made it up in uh, fish and game funds and other funds. 
So I was kind of surprised to hear you say that the department is severely challenged. Where where are you challenged? With what sorts of funds are you are not making up? Um, we are challenged in the fact that we probably need more COs than we currently staff. And if we fill, you know, if we fill the open positions that we have in COs, um, we wouldn't be able to meet the budget um, targets that the governor had suggested to us. Um, and some of some of our some of these other open staff positions that have gone unfunded over the years are are, are places where we should um, try to seek funding. But um, with the budget crisis that we're looking at right now, with uh, you know coming off of COVID nine you know COVID nineteen, I think it's you know like all departments we need to tighten our belts as best we can and keep going. It also wasn't a um, like an open that we could just say we needed this much general funds. We were provided a number of general funds. This is all you can have. And this is the governor's target dollar value of what you have to meet. So you have to make your budget work. And that is why we have those 10 unfunded positions. 10, you said 10? 10. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murray, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. I had some line item questions too. I don't know if we should do that later on. Um, but I guess right now I, I got a partial answer to it, I think before. Um, you said that there's a 600,000 from general funds. And in the budget, I found the 500,000, but I can't find, I'm, I'm missing the 100,000. You said something about a match, but where do I find that 100,000 in the budget? It's on, uh, it's on page 602. It's on the exact, on the first page of the budget in accounting unit 5068. Accounting unit which? 5068. Page 596. It's on, uh, sorry, I was uh, looking at one of my questions, but it's on, uh, it's right at the very beginning. Ah, of, okay. It's right at the very bottom of the page. That's why I didn't find that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I was okay. looking over for that. So that went up from fifty to a hundred thousand recently. Yes. Right. Senator Murray, go ahead with your other questions. Is um, okay. Let's. Uh, can you speak to the debt service? This is on page 603. Um, it's gone down significantly. Um, just a word about how that is going. Well, the reason for that is there was two or three bienniums that we did not put in any capital budget request. And the reason for that is we knew that we were not going to have the funding to pay those 20 year bonds back. So for this biennium, I reduced our debt service. It will definitely go up in the next biennium. We've had, for this past biennium, we have had capital budget requests out there and we certainly have a big one out there that we're requesting now in this new biennium coming up for the powder mill hatchery. Thank you. On 610, contracts for program services, is, am I on the right line? Yeah, what was that? That's gone away completely. Is that something that you were cutting that you didn't want to go away? Or is that a program that's simply gone? Actually, class 102, uh, DAS informed us that class 102 is not an appropriate class to use for what we were using it for. Class 103 is more appropriate. So if you go through our budget anywhere, any accounting unit that had a class 102, we have zeroed them out and uh, budgeted them in more appropriate classes. And you're looking at on page 615, where that, where's that 360,000 coming from on intra-agency transfer 029? That's new, I assume it's coming from someplace else, but I wasn't able to 
That is the same type of class line switch. If you look down on class 217 interagency payments for fiscal years 20 and 21, there was a large expense there. And for 22 and 23, it is zeroed out. That expense went up to class 29. Thank you. And uh, what land acquisition and easements do you do? That's 617. I see that's in the budget from last time and before it's gone up, but can you speak about your program for land acquisition? Uh, do you wanna to speak to that or? <laughs> we have an active program um, where we purchase, usually we're purchasing easement, but sometimes it's in fee. Um, and the purpose is usually to uh, protect have, you know, crucial habitats in the state. Um, it also, one of the requirements we do is, is that it, um, when we put an easement on a piece of property, it will allow for public trespass, including hunting, fishing, and trapping. Unless we're in a very specific uh, habitat where we're trying to protect some you know, endangered species or something where that type of trespass would, would threaten the species at that question. Thank you, and one last thing. You weren't here. I don't know if you were here the last time. Can you update me on the blending turtles and the cottontails? I see that those programs are zeroed out now. <laughs> I worry about those turtles. Um, I, I'm afraid I wasn't here last year, so I'm not <laughs> sure what was said last year. State, um, state wildlife grants are a little bit different than our regular ongoing appropriation of PR and DJ grants, meaning they are competitive grants at the federal level and they were given out specifically for those programs. And the grants that we received were named specifically New England Cottontail and Blandings. That does not mean in any way that we are not continuing work on those species. We just do not have a specific grant named for that species at this point in time. So don't you worry about the turtles or the, or the cottontails. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me go on here. Not a problem. Representative Petrie. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, of course, we know we got stars with uh, on Northwoods Law. How much revenue do we uh, recognize from that? Uh, the state doesn't. Um, each um, episode, I believe, pays a fee of $2,500, and that goes to the New Hampshire Wildlife Heritage uh, Foundation. Mm -hmm. They, in turn, write grants to fishing game. They, they, they also do other fundraisers, uh, you know, besides that, but uh, they all, then they turn around and write grants specifically to New Hampshire uh, fishing game for specific issues. Uh, they underwrite our canine program very heavily, uh, search and rescue issues, uh, you know, maybe equipment, um, that kind of stuff, as well as it could be programming. Uh, going back to the New England Cottontail uh, you're pushing my ability. Um, there is a disease that's running uh, through rabbits right now, and we're putting up a boundary fence around uh, one of our facilities that does research on the New England cottontail, um, and, the, and the foundation paid for it, it, it wrote a grant to, to do that. Um, one of the other very successful programs they did um, at our hatcheries, um, basically, uh, what what's gone on is is it, um, it's basically they we they've granted us money to build greenhouse structures over our raceways, and on on these instead of having like like plastic like you'd see in a plant greenhouse on the pipes, the, uh, it's actually netting, and this is used to keep uh, wild uh, predators out of our hatcheries, and it's it's it's. It's made a huge difference. Made a huge difference. Almost a ten percent <laughs> difference in survivability of our trout run through the hatcheries. Um, so they've done. They they underwrite a lot of good programs for us. Representative Lynn, you had a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I wonder if I could ask. Um, on page uh, six seventeen, towards the bottom, the uh, 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 classification two seventeen. The interagency transfer there it went from three hundred thousand to four ninety three. I'm just wondering, is that another one where classification is just a classification change? Um, 
I'm sorry, are, are we looking at the, on 217? Page, uh, page 617. Yeah. Uh, uh, down towards the bottom, line 217. I think it goes from 300, am I reading that correctly? It goes from 300,000 to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. I'm, uh, I'm, well, I'm reading that's it. Well, that's four. It's research, I guess maybe, I'm sorry, it's research and management. Is that correct? It goes from 300,000 to 493? That is correct. And we actually fund a lot of contracts through this class line. Okay. A lot of research contracts, especially with UNH and other partners. Okay, so have you, may I have, ask a follow-up? Certainly. Yeah, so in other words, I, so you have a almost a $200,000 increase in that. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about what that's for? I would not be the expert, sir, to talk about that. That would be more the wildlife division chief. Um, I'm not the expert on the wildlife habitat account. And when we, when we do budget, I can say this, when we do budget, we, in, we have in anticipated future expenditures based on what we think potentially could be coming down the pipeline. I do know that we use this class line um, for a lot of rental equipment, a lot of on the ground work at our wildlife management areas. We'd be happy to uh, sit down and chat with the wildlife chief and we'll get back to you with a more we, exact answer. We, we could do that. Okay, yeah, that, that, would, be, I, that would be helpful. I appreciate it. Uh, did you have anything else, Representative Lynn? I, I did not. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Representative Petrie, I think you are next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my next question. Uh, windmills and bird strikes. Uh, do we record how many birds we take out? Are they reported to you? And uh, what is your budget? Uh, is that a big budget or I don't imagine it would be a big one, but uh, is there a cost involved? I don't believe I know anything about that. Yeah, I, I, once again, I'm afraid I don't know um, an answer to the question. Let me speak to our folks. I know, um, once again, let me speak to my wildlife department. I'll get back to you with an answer on that. Thank you very much. Representative Heath, you had a question? Um, my, my question is on um, page 634, and it, it's not a big increase, but I'm more curious about the overall um, line item. Um, it's um, statewide public boat access, and everything we've gone through, um, I see it's, it's an increase of um, just about $60,000, but um, it seems like there'd be more um, uh, action around that line. Um, considering the number of tourists and, and people that are using those public boat accesses right now. Can you just describe what's happening? How did it go? Um, did you see huge increases over the summer? Did it work well or did it have problems? It, yes, it worked well. Yes, we saw increases. Yes, we had problems. Yes, we have problems. <laughs> um, other than that, no, no. <laughs> Uh, that's funded when somebody registers their boat. So unless boat, you know, when boat registration numbers change, that's, that's how that funds out to us. Um, so if you register your boat and use it once, doesn't matter how many times you use it. So um, it, in a year like last year, I'm sure people got out and did a lot more with their boats than they normally do. So it, it increased it. Um, the other issue that shows up is, is we had a lot of non-boaters. I mean, it, a, a boat ramp becomes a access to water for people that aren't um, boating. And uh, um, we, the other source of income is, 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 a, is a, we use this, we use the money coming in from the boat registrations as a state match with federal money. When we take the federal money one of the strings that's attached to that is the only thing that can take place at a boat landing is, you know, launching boats and, and recovering boats. Not, you know, it's not a place to go swimming. It's not a place for fishing, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to actually make sure that that activity doesn't take place 
um, which can create some issues from time to time, but at the end of the day, we've, we've been able to live with it pretty well um, and, and try to get people to go to other places. Uh, our, our basic issue is if it's not a safety issue, then we try not to, you know, be too aggressive in the enforcement of, of it. But if it becomes a safety issue, then we really do need to be. Uh, excuse me, let me interrupt just a second, I'm sorry. Uh, are there any capital projects this year for boat ramps or are we? Yeah, um, we're finishing one up on Alton Bay. It's not a capital. Oh, project. I'm sorry. No, not a capital. My, my, my mistake. We are finishing up a large boat landing at Alton Bay. It, it's not a capital project, um, but it, it is over a million dollars. So it's a public um, works. It is going through DPW, yes. Yeah. And that's one of our bigger projects that I think we've done on boat landings. Um, I believe we got two other boat landings that they'll be working on this year, but they're much smaller in size and scale. And then uh, the constant, you know, repairs and, you know, uh, one of the problems that happens with boat launches, uh, you know, sand moves in. So you, we're constantly out doing even minor repairs. But, and then of course, sometimes you're out there uh, quite often these boat launches are either plank or, or concrete ties that are, that are chained or roped together and we need to get in and, and you know, do some maintenance and whatnot on some of the structures. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have my hike safe cards, by the way. My husband and I have our Thank hike you. safe. So um, since we're on the public boat access, I've, I've well, one question there and then just another question. Um, what do the consultants do? You've got an uptick in consultancy fees here. Um, can you give an example of what the consultants do? And my second question is, can you address your, your federal funds? Is that a reliable source of funding? I know that some agencies stress what the federal government's going to do. Um, are the federal funds that come to you, are you, are they, do you, do you feel secure in the federal funding in terms of how that money comes to you? Do you uh, uh, let me know, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Yeah. Absolutely, and the federal funds are very, I'll answer the second part first. The federal funding is very secure. It's part of our um, uh, DJ funds, I single guess them. Part of our DJ funds, they are very secure. It's an annual apportionment um, from the feds every, every year. The reason why you see an uptick in class 46, the only thing that line is used for is a contract with our engineering consultants. And every couple of years we do go out to bid for that. And the reason why it's 125,000 in the first year of this budget is for the project at Alton Bay, the Downings Landing project. That is gonna be coming in, as the director said, at over a million dollars between the federal funds and the state match. It's a very large project. There's gonna be a lot of engineering fees that go into that. Uh, I would encourage you all, uh, um, for those of you that are familiar, where, you know, as you come up Route 16, when you first start seeing the waters of Lake Winnipesaukee right there in Alton, um, the, the east side of the lake, that's where this piece of property is. It's right at the very beginning of the lake. And it, um, it's a beautiful piece of property. Um, and it was a great opportunity. The fishing game was able to purchase it a few years ago. And then we've been kind of pitching away at, at, at building the land and, and this, this summer we hope to finish it. And I encourage you all, if you're in that neighborhood to stop by and take a quick peek. It's very critical that we hold on to our boat access funds in the dedicated account because we're counting on those to pay for this project. <laughs> Representative Lynn, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Commissioner Murray, I wonder, um, you, uh, with regard to the 10 positions that you uh, that um, are, are vacant and unfunded, could you just tell us how long, how long have those positions been vacant? Uh, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, I can. Okay. I can give you a uh, round idea. The four conservation officers have been vacant for at least the last three bienniums. Okay. So for several years. The 
two positions in our public affairs division, the same thing. They have been vacant for at least the last three to four bienniums. The wildlife biologist position, at least the last two bienniums. Landowner relations, justice, current biennium. Um, and the fisheries biologist, at least three bienniums. And then the new, the number 10, we're just unfunding is another fisheries biologist. Um, no, I'm sorry, that wasn't a, fishery, a fisheries biologist, I'm sorry. That was the hatchery manager position. That has been at least three bienniums, three to four bienniums. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. So these are basically not new unfunded positions. We only uh, have one that is new. The nine other ones are not new. They're currently unfunded for this biennium and they were unfunded in the last biennium. All right, thank you very much. Are there, oh, uh, Representative Petrie, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for taking this new question. Um, ticks, where are we at on that? And uh, what are we, what kind of money are we throwing at that to uh, solve the problem? Um, which ticks are you referencing? So well, the, the ticks attack up the north or the deer ticks in the deer well, ticks? I didn't realize we had a problem in both places, but uh, well, one one set of ticks, the moose ticks, are, are are quite harmful to our northern moose population. The ticks that um, create Lyme disease in humans—that's a different tick. They're not. There's a bunch of different ticks in the world. They're not all the same. Um, so, if you're talking about Lyme disease, um, I don't think we deal with that in this department. We don't. But do we, I mean, what, what are we doing about the ticks? You know, I, I haven't seen a moose uh, in the South here for a while. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I know we've talked about it in the past. of uh, Yeah. Um, well, we've actually kind of, uh, this year we're suggesting um, a, a little different management technique with our moose population. And we've bifurcated the state. Um, the issue up north are the ticks that infect that they latch onto the moose and, and basically what happens this time of year from now until the end of winter beginning of the spring up north um, these ticks basically bleed the moose out and and it does two things number one it kills the younger moose the yearling moose and number two is, is it, it it reduces the reproductive um, success of other moves. So instead of having a set of twins, you end up with a single. Um, that that or, or or she's not able to have a successful birth and, and raise a calf up to being a yearling. Um, so it, so it depleted our population. Um, there's been research, at, and it sounds a little counterintuitive, but. Maine and Vermont have been pursuing a course where they're trying to reduce the number of moose in this, in this particular, and, it, and there's a kind of a, a southern, a southern bottom to the zone and a northern bottom to the zone. Uh, so like if you get up into Canada, you can actually get above this, this zone of ticks. But uh, from like Grafton North in New Hampshire, um, from Northern Grafton County North, it falls into this zone where these ticks live. And um, what we're trying to do is reduce the number a little bit, and hopefully that in turn will reduce the number of ticks and allow the population of moose to rebound. In the southern part of the state, it's a little different issue. Um, the, the, what happens there is, is um, you have brain worm that, gets, that, that impacts the, the moose population down there and reduces the moose population. And um, there we are trying to, we've uh, reduced uh, the moose tags that we're going to be, that we've suggested that we reduce the number of moose tags that we will be issuing uh, over the next uh, hunting seasons uh, in the southern, southern tier of the state to try to rebound the population a bit down there. Thank you. Representative Murray, I believe you are next. Thank you again, Madam Chair. 
when you say unfunded, is that unfilled or are you saying that there are other people who are covering these positions that aren't funded? Can you just clarify when you say unfunded, is that a person who is not working there or is someone kind of doing double time, uh, like taking care of the fish hatcheries if you have an unfunded position there? Unfunded is an authorized position number that has no funding associated with it for the biennium, meaning we cannot fill it. We have no authority to fill it because there's no funds associated with it. So unfunded is unfilled. Correct. And so are there other people covering this or is there stuff not getting done? Uh, there is stuff oh. not getting done and there are other people covering what can be covered. So both. thank you. <laughs> Representative Heath. My question continues with that topic. So if we were to populate those funds, would that equate to higher revenues in fish and game? So are we being penny foolish by not populating those lines with people? Um, and would it result in higher income and uh, what might that possibly be? Well, it depends on how, you know, it depends on which position. Um, if you give me more COs, that probably is not going to increase um, license sales. What it does do is it helps to increase uh, safety, <laughs> uh, safety in the field. Um, for example, I, I can't remember the date, but a couple weekends ago, um, coming from the north, the north country is a little different than the rest of the state. Uh, we, we might be a little bit more laid back. I. I actually get people stopping at my farm and talking to my wife about problems with fish and game now. So it's a, it's a very different type of atmosphere up north than it is in other places. So on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon, my phone rings and it's somebody complaining about uh, snow machines driving off trail on private property, being disrespectful and causing problems, which um, being off trail is, is, is a ticketable offense. Uh, but in general, you know, um, negative interaction between outdoors people and landowners usually ends up in landowners shutting their property down to outdoor activity. So the fishing game takes these, these, these calls very, very seriously. Um, so I, I got hold of our Colonel and he was getting ready to dispatch, he dispatched a, a CO to go to this town in Stewartstown. And before we could get up to Stewartstown, we had two calls that we, that we, that were rescue calls, hiking rescue calls. Uh, one of which we flew National Guard helicopter to airlift a, a, a person off the side of one of the mountains down in Grafton County. And the other one, uh, the weather had gotten so bad, the helicopter no longer could fly or we were dispatching two groups of people to climb the mountain to, to try to rescue these folks. And then we ended up by, by four o'clock, we had four more uh, snowmobile wrecks and we had to dispatch COs to that. So the CO that was supposed to go up and try to catch these folks never got there until the next the next day, and um, that's what we run into is is especially on weekends busy times we run out of COs we have forty one COs in the state, um, the entire state, and uh, city of Concord has more police officers than we have COs and and it, I understand it's a different job I understand it's a um, you know it, 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 different level of staffing, but at the same time, we are spread pretty thin. Um, now, one of the places like in our um, communications department, uh, there's a program in, in, in um, the world of fishing game called R3. And what it's all about is trying to, uh, R3 is what, recruit, retrain. Recruitment, retain and reactivate. Um, license holders. So what it's about is how do you get somebody, now we have different types, like, like I've always bought my license by, you know, the end of January, I religiously go buy a hunting and fishing license. Uh, so you got people like me, and you have other people that might buy one every five years, every 10 years, trying to get those folks to buy more often. And then you've also got other folks that just didn't get exposed to hunting and fishing growing up and, and trying to get them to try it and buy a license. Um, and this is a national program that a lot of states have bought into and, and have been working hard at uh, to try to increase their license sales. So that would be an example of where a position might help us 
increase our funding level. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions? Because I, I do have some, if I could. Uh, Director Mason, my question is, as I went through your budget, it appears that you are moving people around within the various departments. Could you kind of explain that a little bit? Uh, I'm not sure we are, are we? Moving people around. What we did, Representative Umberger, is um, in order to meet the governor's target, we moved moved several positions from accounting units that were funded mainly by fish and game funds into dedicated sources of funding in order to free up some fish and game funds. We moved a couple of people from fisheries into the fisheries habitat account, which is dedicated. We moved two conservation officers in the northernmost part of the state from accounting unit 7887 into dedicated account 1183 OHRV. Is that what you are referring to? I can't hear you. Representative Umberger, you have you need to turn the mute button. We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, for example, under um, statewide public boat access yes you we go moved. from two to three and so yep. that was that was what my question was were the were the areas where you moved the people short or was it because of your ability to fund within that particular area it, it was in order to meet the guidelines that we were provided by the governor's office and maintain our 192 people without having to let anybody go. Okay. Uh, I have another question and this deals with the, um, with your uh, commission. Um, if I'm not mistaken here, it shows the uh, commission with a $2 million budget. And maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it- uh, What it page, may I ask what page you're on? I'd love to find it for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I, I check marked it, but uh, now of course I can't find it, but- uh, Give me just a second here and I... Oh, you're on page 602 at the end of that um, division. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that, that number there, Representative Umberger, is a subtotal of the accounts above it. Okay, I was waiting for a question, Mickey. I'm sorry. That's I, okay. I, I think, sorry. is, is that... <laughs> so, okay, so the... Um, the ex Oh, that's... It says expenditure total for Fish and Game Commission yeah. is $2 million. That, and that's a subtotal of the accounts above it for that um, section of their budget. Correct. The, the okay, so this is all the wildlife stuff? No, we refer to this section of the budget as the office of the director. It's not under a specific division like the wildlife division, the business division, public affairs, law enforcement. This first section of the budget is the office of the director or fish and game commission is what it's referred to. So that is the subtotal of that section of the department. So like our grant writer works in my, works in the commissioner's office. Uh, our AG works in the commissioner's office. We have- Well, it's all those accounting units. Right, right. Yeah. So this is all the accounts from the beginning of Fish and Game through page 602. Correct. Right. 
Okay. All right. Fine. I'm. I'm like. This didn't make any sense to me. So. <laughs> no, that is correct. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I do have that, some. That, in, that includes, if I may say, a big portion of that is our transfers to DOIT, that interagency transfer to the Department of Information Technology, which is well over nine hundred thousand dollars. What what six hundred? You can see that page six hundred, the transfer to uh, OIT. DOIT, yeah. Okay. Um, you had mentioned dispatch, and I think I heard the governor say the fishing game dispatch was going under the E911 system. We believe yeah. that that's going to be in HB2. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I'm sure it is. Um, how many people in Fish and Game are associated with dispatch? One full time, three part time. I'm sorry, what? One full time and three part time people. But one of the issues that takes place is our dispatch um, does more than just um, dispatch COs and uh, the plan will be that we will maintain one of our phone lines in and uh, that will create and you know they'll deal with people calling in looking for answers to questions about wildlife issues that they are having at home. Um, you know you got a bear what do I how, how do I get a bear out of my garage how do I you know stop a bear from attacking my chickens. Um, what do I do with a skunk on my front dooryard? Um, we, we receive a lot of questions like that. So we're going to have to restructure uh, the way we manage some of our outreach to these folks. Uh, traditionally, it's gone through our dispatch and it's handled that way. Um, so the, uh, the, the, right now, the plan is for us to continue to manage that here, but do it through phone lines instead. Okay, so um, of the one full time and three part time, how many will be retained? One. The one full time. Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. So uh, one full time will remain. Correct. And he'll be called uh, outreach person. Yeah, well, I, we don't have a title. We haven't done it yet. Okay, but that's that's the concept. Yes. I'll be back with you in uh, in just a uh, just a second. Um, on on the land acquisition and easements. Are you planning any large purchases this year or, or is this mostly uh, easement kind of work? Quite often it's mostly easement. Um, we, we are looking at several parcels uh, currently, um, I, but I, 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 I'm, not sure I just, I'm not sure I can say whether they're big or small at this point. Are those mostly up north or are they down south? No, or are they're all over the state, which creates the issue with big and small. Um, a small piece of property. We're, we're actually looking at a piece right now. I believe it's in the town. Uh, let me, it's in the Exeter area. I, I, won't, I won't say definitely Exeter, but this is a small, it's a very small piece of property, but it, it, it hooks up with a bunch of other properties. And it helps us uh, to defend a rather large uh, conservation area, um, and so I approved the I approved our, our people going forward. Whether we actually get there or not, I don't know. Um, but up north, you can obviously buy more more acres for your dollar than you can down south. But and especially when you get critical habitats, some you know there are habitats. That you got to be down south by, and they don't exist up in the north country. So, 
the other place that over the years fishing game has has uh, spent quite a bit of money is around Great Bay, and you know we're obviously not the only folks down there. Nature Conservancy, I believe U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and others have have uh, protected a large area around Great Bay, but it's certainly one of our special special areas in the state. How do, how do you um, work between fishing game and the other conservation things that are all around the state? Yeah. Do you have working agreements with them, or is it quite um, often we're sharing on a piece of property? We you know we might hold an easement where they they own it outright, or you know we different groups will come together with money and and buy you know buy parcels um, and. and but then each parcel will have its have its own uh, uh, easement, or uh, I don't want to say an MOU, but at, at least the, the plan on how to manage that that piece of land. Uh, but yes, we do work with other conservation organizations quite well in the state of New Hampshire, um, um, both the large ones and also the small ones. Okay. We, we maintain. Uh, we have a uh, what's Jim's title, Kathy? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, but we have a person in our agency that maintains those relationships. Okay. Um, as I'm looking at the uh, last page of your budget, it shows that you have an increase of one position in 2022 from 2019 or 2020 and 2021. It goes from 190 to 191. And so I'm just um, interested in, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I saw a lot of changes throughout your, uh, out your budget in the number of, um, of that, positions, but. That position is represented on page 632 in accounting unit 2289. That position is the result of a very large donation uh, benefactor, if you will, is that what you call a person yeah. who makes a very large donation to our Great Bay um, Sandy Point Research Center. And this is a donation that is gonna go on for many, many, many years. A million dollars a year she wanted to provide to the department. The Reader's Digest version is <laughs> we created a class 59, which is temporary full time, 100% funded by the proceeds of this donation to be a management or a program management position out at our Sandy uh, Great Bay Research Reserve. And that is where that position will be, and it will be funded in perpetuity by this donation from this benefactor. Oh, that, that's, that's wonderful. Abs absolutely wonderful. I don't know who arranged for that, but uh, thank them. It, it was a lot of work. <laughs> Yes, I know those things don't come easy. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's for darn sure. So, are there any other questions that anyone has for fish and game? Okay, if I'm not mistaken, we've got uh, a couple of items that you need to get back to us on. One was on. Uh, One minute. Um, um. Mark Ellingwood is chief of our wildlife division, and he just joined us, and I think he could answer one of those questions for you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Ellingwood. It's a pleasure to meet you. I understand you had a question regarding uh, increases in habitat expenditures in the 2155 org. Yeah. Uh, Mark, we can hardly hear you. I'm sorry. I don't know where the microphone is, but... Uh... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's much better. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, regarding the habitat increased expenditures, 
I simply wanted to mention that uh, those monies, which are both federal funds matched with uh, dedicated habitat stamp revenue, those increases reflect a significant increase in investments in infrastructure on the 80,000 or so acres that we manage and oversee throughout the state. The commission through policy has directed us to, uh, to uh, intensify our management of those properties and those expenditures are a reflection of that effort. Uh, the type of work done in that circumstance includes the maintenance of roads, the replacement of undersized culverts, the establishment of parking areas, and uh, the placement of educational kiosks. In addition, there's some additional money being spent in that or in that specific class for non-commercial habitat management on those same lands. Oh, uh, yeah. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, can you answer the bird strike question? I, I'll take a stab at it and tell you that we don't expand appreciable funds related to that, except as it pertains to the siting of those types of facilities. Um, we try to guide all interests in the state in terms of how to minimize potential impacts. Um, typically permits that uh, provide for the establishment of uh, wind farms, as an example, require that the actual commercial interests collect that data we have access to it, um, but we're not specifically spending money in that regard. So the commercial entities provide that information to Fish and Game? Is that um, what I heard you say? I believe we have access to it through their data collection, yes. Do they provide okay. it also to Fish and Wildlife? Uh, Joe, does that answer your question about bird strikes? I think that'll suffice for the time. Uh, I think it's going to be a problem at the more uh, wind farms we put up because uh, we're losing, you know, eagles and, uh, you know, protected birds. Uh, thank you. Mark, if, a, if an eagle is struck, does that go to us or does that go to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Um, that would go to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service specifically, but we are close partners with them and that information would be shared with us as well. Um, there's a close partnership there. Um, I'm not aware of that happening here specifically. We don't have substantial wind power farms at this point, but we're keenly aware of the controversies and the potential if misplaced to uh, have adverse impacts. So we very much appreciate your interest in the subject. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions that anyone has for Fish and Game? Representative, I just would like to clarify something with uh, Kathy on the debt service specifically. We talked about that earlier. Um, okay. does, does the debt service line, Kathy, include um, if the powder mill hatchery and the capital budget is approved? Well, yes, it would. However, if it is approved by the time that Treasury actually goes out and secures those bonds, it will... The timing of it, I really don't anticipate too much of that debt being repaid within this biennium. Okay. So the in all actuality. Okay. So there's no contingency on what you have appropriated in there based on that capital budget item? No, not at this point. Okay. Okay. Um, seeing nothing else, I will. Uh close this, uh, this area. And if we have further questions, um, we'll definitely get back to you, but uh, thank you for um, your openness and candidness. And um, I think that uh, based on what, what I saw and reviewed, um, your budget is very good and that um, more than likely there won't be any problems from uh, division two. I'm only speaking for myself. I can't speak for anybody else, but uh, I thought you did a good job and, uh, and thank you so much. And by the way, Director Mason, welcome aboard. I know that uh, you haven't been there long, 
but we're uh, we're happy to have you. And um, unfortunately, you're sitting at the far end of the table, so it's hard to um, make out your facial features. But that's okay. We'll. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, sometime in the near future we'll have an opportunity to uh, to meet face to face. And I know you've got a lot of other issues out there with uh, with fish and game. Uh, committee, and I'm sure that uh, we'll we'll find all kinds of things going on. But thank you so much, you and Kathy, for uh, for the great job that, that you've done. And for the uh, Division Two, I will see all of you on Monday morning. Thank you. Great. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. And thank have, you. have a nice weekend. And um, I only have two meetings tomorrow, so um, I hope none of you have any. So good luck and, uh, and take care. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.